right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our meeting. Uh, on the call of meeting to order. Everyone, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, a quick note I want to read something for everyone to uh, before we start the meeting. The board meeting will be held in person under the current Open Public Meetings Act. In person board meetings will be held without restrictions on capacity and without physical distancing requirements. However, a remote option must be made available. Under Governor Jay Inslee's Proclamation 20 05, and in accordance with the Washington State Secretary of Health. Secretary of Health's order, in-person attendees are required to wear face coverings. The board must ensure the requirements are followed as Proclamation 20-5.15 prohibits any governmental commercial or non-entity, non-profit entity or private party from allowing any individual to enter or remain in any indoor space under their control unless the individual is in compliance with the Secretary of Health's face covering order and any subsequent amendments. The remote meeting option continues to be available for those who do not wish to wear face coverings or do not feel comfortable attending in person. Those attending remotely may sign up to provide public comment using an online form, which will be accessible at 5.15 p.m. on the day of the meeting. <sighs> okay. Uh, the first thing on our agenda this evening is special recognition. Uh, Dr. Pierce will give that first presentation. Thank you, President Connors. I also just want to uh, remind everyone that under the uh, mask order, it is allowable for people when they're here speaking from the podium or people when they're at that podium uh, to temporarily remove their mask while they're speaking and distanced. So uh, the first order of business tonight is recognition. We have a couple of items for special recognition and the first one is school board recognition. And uh, our board members, hopefully you saw the posters that our schools all uh, made in your honor um, that are up on the walls. And so our big thank you from our schools to you and to your service. We also have a little cookie box <laughs> there for you at your seat. And I'd like to uh, read the governor's proclamation because uh, it is school board recognition month. Whereas the mission of Washington's public school system is to assure that all students achieve at high levels and possess the knowledge and skills to be responsible members of a democratic society who enjoy productive and satisfying lives. And whereas Washington's 295 locally elected school boards and nine elected educational service district boards are the core of the public education governance system in our state. And whereas the districts and regions they lead serve more than 1 million students have a combined annual budget of over $15 billion and employ approximately 120,000 people. And whereas school directors play a crucial role in promoting student learning and achievement by creating a vision, establishing policies and budgets, and setting clear standards of accountability for all involved. And whereas school directors are directly accountable to the res residents in their districts and regions, serving as a vital link between members of the community and their schools, and whereas school directors and educational service districts provide a passionate voice of advocacy for public schools and the welfare of school children, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize school directors as outstanding volunteers and champions for public education. Now, therefore, I, Jay Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby proclaim January 2022 as School Board Recognition Month in Washington, and I encourage all people in our state to join me in this special observation. And the proclamation is signed uh, by Governor Jay Inslee. So in addition to the governor's recognition on behalf of the students and staff in our district, I want to also uh, thank you and appreciate all of your support uh, for our schools, our students, uh, our staff in our district. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on our special recognition is fall sports. Uh, Mr. Jack Anderson will be giving that presentation. 
Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to uh, be able to do this again. We haven't done it for a while, and that's to recognize our uh, outstanding uh, student uh, esports athletes and our student athletes at our respective high schools. So, and what a great opportunity for uh, this large crowd to see some remarkable uh, uh, young men and women today. And uh, we'd like uh, to introduce those to you. So I'd like to start out with uh, bringing up to the podium Mr. Tim Wood, the athletic director at Southridge. And he will introduce uh, uh, the advisor of our esports program. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate that. And again, I appreciate the board giving us the opportunity to compete in esports. And I know um, with what we've been doing at Southridge with my head coach and advisor and along with our students, we are definitely leading the charge in esports, uh, not only in Tri-Cities, but in Eastern Washington. So with that, it's my honor and privilege to bring up our head coach, Jason Giancola, and some of our student athletes. Thank you, school board members. Uh, I'm Jason Giancola. I'm the esports coach and uh, advisor up at Southridge High School. Um, just a quick, uh, quick, brief history of esports at the school. Like I told some of you guys, might not have heard of what we've been doing. Uh, we've been an active group at a national level for the past two years. Uh, our first season ran into COVID. We actually had a foreign exchange student have to leave our team and go back. Uh, Emil, our team really liked him. Uh, he was a very, very fun group uh, person to play with. Um, that team ended up placing fifth in the Pacific Coast Conference out of 40 plus teams, uh, which is huge for an inaugural season. Uh, later that fall, we had an Overwatch team that placed fourth out of 50 plus teams in the similar conference. Uh, but this season is why I'm here, and, and this is where I'm really excited about. Uh, that we had 60 plus team members join us, ranging from competing to helping run things behind the scenes that help me out. Um, our League of Legends team placed first uh, overall in the season and then finished ninth in playoffs against 60 more plus teams from the, our, I think we joined the Mountain region. Uh, that team consists of Nate, Daniel, Levi, Saul, Kevin, and Zach. I'll invite them all up at the end of the uh, talk to have them fist bump you guys. Um, our Overwatch team finished eighth overall out of 80 plus teams. It was Nate, Davian, Saul, Skyler, Nick, Tristan, Nate, Brandon, and Zach. Um, our Rocket League team finished 10 per, uh, top 10% out of almost 900 teams, um, and that was nationwide. Um, and that was Tristan, Zach, and Nick. Our Valorant team finished in that top 10% out of almost 1,000 teams, uh, which is awesome. We are one of the highest ranked teams in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, that was Daniel, Charlie, Nate, Nick, Nicholas, Austin, Cole, and Allen. And then a team that really came together and spoke really well for our team and gave us an awesome showing nationally. Uh, was our Smash Brothers team that finished fifth out of 65 teams in our mountain uh, west uh, region, which was Cassius, Saul, and Skyler. So, um, at this point, I'd like to invite them up. Can you guys have this bump and you guys have any questions for me at all? That's great. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, second on our agenda, I'd like to introduce uh, Anna Harris from uh, Kennewick High School. 
and she has a couple uh, presentations to do tonight. Anna? We had um, two honors tonight. I'll start first with cross, girls cross country and Macy Marquardt and Coach Marquardt. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here tonight. Um, however, Macy finished, was state champion in 3A girls cross country. She finished at state with a 1731 and beat the second place girl by 58 seconds. Um, she went on to um, win the Nike Northwest Conference, or not conference champ, but invite in Boise. She was recently named the Gatorade Player of the Year for Girls Cross Country for Washington. That just came out a couple days ago, and she signed with Boise State. Um, up next is my honor to bring up Coach Randy Affolter and our football program. Can I, can I ask you a quick question? <laughs> you found a Boise, did you get a scholarship at Boise? Yes. yes. <laughs> That's awesome. So my player, George, gave me a hard time using my first name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this past fall, uh, we had a we had a great year. It was a uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, we ended up playing, it, you know, for the state championship, three A level. And, uh, and I've told a lot of people this. I believe the reason why we had the opportunity is because I really believe that the Mid Valley uh, Columbia Conference is so competitive that it that it set us up for for tournament time. Um, when we started the year, we were we struggled a little bit, and we really felt probably about uh, after our week six game, uh, we played our crosstown rival. Uh, they got us, um, <laughs> but it really helped us get ourselves going in the right direction. And then when we got in the tournament, um, we really did some good things. You know, we won our first, well, no, our, our yeah, round of 16 game. If you're there at the game, we run, won the last you know, two minutes and 30 seconds to win the football game. And then and then we had to run the gauntlet. We had to play kind of the blue bloods of the uh, state, O'Day High School, Eastside, Eastside Catholic High School. Uh, we beat O'Day in the quarters, we beat Eastside Catholic in the semis, and then we finally had to play Bellevue in the finals and just came up short. You know, we had our, we had our chances, but it did not work out. Uh, some of our kids are here. I'm not gonna have them all come up. Uh, guys, will you stand up, please? Football player, kid with high school. Raise your hand. One thing I like to say about about kids, though, in high school athletics, just in general for everybody, you got to realize a lot of these kids put a lot of time into it. You know, a lot of summer times waking up at 730, you know, working out, getting themselves pre prepared to play Saturdays and, you know, coming in after games and uh, watching film and all those things. You know, I think high school athletics is one of the best things going for kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm glad you support us and, and we're honored to be here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. And lastly, our newest uh, athletic director to the uh, Kennewick School District from Kamaikan High School, Kyle Cowan. Thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we had a pretty dynamic fall season this year um, with all of our sports really doing quite well. But today I'm joined with two of our uh, fall sports programs. Um, first, we're going to start with cross country, our boys cross country team. So I'd like to invite Coach Matt Rexis up here to uh, talk about his program. That was a pretty tall <laughs> table. <there. laughs> Anyway, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and share a little bit. Um, everybody here has worked really hard in all their respective sports, and uh, coaches know how much goes into it. Parents know how much goes into it, and obviously the kids do as well. Um, I guess I'm going to have my top 12 just go ahead and stand up real quick. Most of them have been varsity at one time or another this year. So go ahead, everybody who's there, go ahead and stand up. Uh, Jack Judy, Eric Benedict, Jacob Cave, Logan Blazer, 
Um, John has been Rexus. Adam Chan, Jackson Ferris, Tanner Mills. Jack Johnson's not here. I think he's, I think he's sick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ezra Teeple, Grayson Wilcott, and Isaac and Isaac Teeple. And I think we have a couple of extras. Who did I not call? Somebody. Okay. <laughs> Didn't call Austin, but he, he came in. So. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Just like in class with your mask on, it's hard to hear. <laughs> um, anyway, um, basically, yeah, this year we were fortunate enough to win our fourth straight state title. Uh, the first three were at 3A level, and then this year was at the 4A level. But these boys have not looked at what classification level we've participated at. Um, in fact, they have not lost to anybody in the state of Washington through the state meet since 2016. Wow. So, which is kind of crazy. We go to a lot of invitationals that have 40 or 50 teams and, you know, a good number of them are 4A. And uh, so they, they're they not happy unless they are number one in the state, <laughs> regardless of classification. And again, this year was our fourth straight year. We weren't sure when it was going to happen because uh, the last year was canceled. So, and then we had a season in the spring and well, we had a blizz. Our first meet was a, a blizzard, so we got canceled, <laughs> but there was no state meet. So basically we went 17 months wondering when the state meet was going to happen again, but they stayed focused through it all. And uh, it was kind of, in some respects, it was kind of nice because we lost a lot of people from the previous year. Uh, it was our third straight year going to nationals. Um, after the season was over and we had a lot of freshmen coming in and we knew they were really good but we needed time and so I guess in some respects we hate COVID but it gave us 17 months instead of seven months to get ready for that next one and we were ready for it so pretty proud of them for that um, Isaac Isaac Teeples and Grayson Wilcott were our main two seniors and uh, along well my son was one of the one of the seniors too, and all the all twelve of those guys have been working hard together. We we have forty five usually on our team, but these are the twelve that stuck together through thick and thin. Um, no matter how good you think you are, you also have to be fortunate enough to be healthy and not sick, and especially in this time. So we were very happy to get to the state meet with nobody being sick at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have amazing parents. They set stuff up every time we go to a meet so we can actually, the coaches can actually coach. And then I'd like to thank my assistant coaches. Go ahead and stand up, assistants. We have Julian Brooks and uh, Anne Marie Grigg and Nick Phillips back there, one of our former runners who runs with the kids too. And uh, anyway, obviously it's been tough through the pandemic. We overcame a great deal. We honestly, um, we're not given much of a chance before the season to win, which was even better for us because there was no, not nearly as much pressure as there had been for the previous three years. Um, this year was the 13th straight undefeated league championship season. They've, they're 175 and 0 in those 13 years, so that's something they're pretty proud of. And uh, the senior boys were part of 56 of those, so. Isaac is a two-time state champion, which there hasn't been one for about 25 years. Um, he was a high school All-American this year. He, last year as a junior, he was a Gator, uh, junior. He was the Gatorade Athlete of the Year. We're still waiting to see if he's going to be a two-time Gatorade Athlete of the Year winner, but the boys haven't been announced until next week, so we'll see. Um, he broke seven course records, including the state meet record this year, and it was pretty impressive. He uh, he was the first person to break 15 on the current course. He signed to run a BYU just last week, and uh, that's where the current two-time NCAA champion attended, so I think he's looking to get some good tips. Uh, he's a national qualifier three times and ran the fastest 5K in state history at the national meet that he attended in uh, Alabama uh, just about a month ago. He also has three school records in track and multiple school records in cross country. And the other one, Grayson Wilcott, he's going to Wazoo. Signed with Wazoo, part of two state titles. Uh, he was a three-time All-League, finished third at state this year, two-time national qualifier. And uh, he was Isaac's training partner, and I think they both helped each other to get to the, this level. The other guys, huge. They're 
they're the young guys, they're our future, and uh, we hope to reload and not have to sit back too far. They are looking to continue the streak next year, so thank you. So uh, next is our football coach, Coach Scott Biglin. I'll introduce you. All right. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for, for having us here. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Um, I'm going to kind of echo what uh, Randy talked about. Uh, for some people that didn't understand what the COVID situation was, we've been kind of in, in pretty much all the teams since August of 2020 when we didn't know if there was going to be a season and everything kept getting pushed back. And these guys have been working pretty much for around 14 months of pure football. And uh, that takes a lot of work, especially when you're not too sure what the season's going to look like. And uh, they came in in pods of six, at times didn't use the football, was running routes, sometimes in uh, cold weather. Uh, and they stuck through it through the month of October, November, December. And then we finally got a six game season, which, uh, you know, it gave, it gave them a little bit of a, a reward, but definitely wasn't uh, all it was hyped up to be. Um, but then they got maybe a month off and they're right back into it. So these guys have been we're playing football for a long time. Um, and with that, it brought us together. Um, we had a great season this year. Uh, I think seven of our games we we got the running clock, which was an impressive feat. I know when we didn't get the running clock, people would say, what's wrong with you guys? And it's, <laughs> it's not that easy. Um, but uh, we, we got to the semifinals and we, you know, we lost to, to GK and there were a lot of sad faces. And, you know, even I kind of had a tear in my eye and they kind of looked at me and I just remember telling them, I'm not sad that we lost. I'm, I'm sad that I'm, I'm not going to get to coach these wonderful young men anymore. So a lot of credit goes to, to these guys. And all these athletes out here, they, they deserve a lot of credit for the time and sacrifice going through these times that we're going through. Hopefully, we're kind of past that that point, um, but uh, truly grateful for these wonderful young men. So, awesome. thank you. Congratulations. And congratulations to all the athletes here. That's great stuff. Okay. Uh, Next on our agenda is communication from parents, staff, and district residents. Uh, okay, yeah, we're gonna go find our sign-in sheet. While she does it, I'm gonna read a another quick little quick little note. Uh, <laughs> the mass exodus. Poor guys, they don't. That's all right. Good time for me to read my note. Okay, so the board appreciates hearing from parents, staff, and district residents at our regular board meet business meetings. The Board of Directors provides an opportunity for communications from parents, staff, and district residents. This time is reserved during our work, working meeting for the Board to listen to comments, input, and information. The Board does not respond to comments provided, as our goal is to listen and to learn. As appropriate, the Board will ask the Superintendent and her staff to look into any issues raised. Please note, it is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the Board's business meeting. Please refrain from any verbal expressions, expressions such as clapping or booing in response to a person who is providing public comment, whether positive or negative during the public comment period. The board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff members at board meetings. However, you can email the board with any such comments. Okay. Yes. No one signed up for remotely. No one signed up for remotely? Okay. Okay, I'm still still getting in trouble. Okay, so first uh, first speaker tonight is David Hall. David, would you please come uh, present to the board, please? Okay, so you'll have two minutes. Yeah, and you can take your mask off during the during the conversation. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Um, it's great to celebrate the things today that school is about academic achievement, uh, extracurricular activities, and I hate to spoil the positive mood, but it is important that we talk about what is staring us all in the face, literally, um, and that's the, the mandates that at least it seems a good percentage of our community uh, is against and has been speaking out against for some time now. I have, and my only regret is that I haven't uh, spoken sooner on this issue. Um, as a teacher, with the mandates, I have observed the despondency and hopelessness of my students increase drastically. Many factors are at play here, obviously. It's my conviction, though, that the universal masking is one of the chief causes. Um, the vaccine mandate, taking medicine required by the state, is an extreme overreach, much more invasive. But I would like to talk about masks because they are a symbol of that uh, overreach, that authoritarian uh, Kind of kind of thing that has been gripping our whole our whole country, and you know I speak openly and honestly that it affects our community personally, and I'm very opposed to. It. Teacher and administrator roles have expanded to include that of mass compliance police, not just teachers, not just coaches. This is a, a huge burden. The net effect is a climate of suspicion and fear for all sides, but primarily targeting our students. To continue stating that this is our best path back to normal is subjective and appears to be untrue. Okay. The point here is that there's a distinct cost to this requirement. It's not just a mask. It's not just, oh, you know, it's going to be too greedy for us to potentially say masks can be optional. And, and oftentimes um, uh, this point of view is, um, you know, hyperbolized as saying like, we're against masks. No, I just don't want masks to be required. If masks work, if people feel safer in masks, they should have the right to do that. That's always been, uh, every person's individual choice, and we have lost that. Um, it, the mask is an added distraction in a child's world filled, filled with them. February 1st, next week, will be one year we return to the classroom, a whole year where teachers and students haven't seen their seen each other's faces, okay? Um, Mr. Hall, your, yes. your time is up. Are you, are you? Time's up. I would like to just add a couple of questions. Um, I want to know what the board is able to do to advocate for this part of our community. I have brought an article that was just published yesterday in the Washington Post, you know, not a bastion of conservatism necessarily, but the title is schools can now safely make masks optional with the CDC's new guidelines. And the point is, is that they've, the CDC has concluded that the, the masks aren't, um, cloth masks do almost nothing and maybe even are worse than nothing when not worn properly. And as a teacher and a student and community okay. members of a school district, it's hard to wear them properly for seven and a half hours a day. Okay, at thanks. Least. All right, right. Sir, okay. sir, I do, so, I do, I, your, your time has expired. I need you to move on. Can I, I would like to just share this article. I printed out sir, a few copies you, with the board. You can give us copies of it. We'd be happy to, happy to look at them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, our next speaker is Kennedy Rose. Um. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kennedy Rose. I'm a freshman at Comerican. I played basketball competitively, competitively for five plus years and wanted to play for Comerican, like my brother did. Once we heard we had a test, I was devastated and didn't want to test two to three times per week, so I decided to quit. My mom really wanted me to play after all the years and money she spent, but she also didn't want me to have to test. Since we have been wearing masks at school, I have felt like I don't know anyone and I get dirty looks if I don't have it all the way on my face during passing periods. We don't ever get mask breaks. I have teachers who will yell at kids in the whole class if we don't have them over our nose. There have been times when a student is talking and their mask falls and they get kicked out of the class. If the masks are protecting everyone from COVID, then the students who want to wear them can as well as the teachers. And the students and teachers who don't want to wear them should have a choice. If they get COVID, then they'll have to go home. The schools will get will give out masks at games. They wait until you have it on before they leave. Teachers will give us one warning and then send us to ISS. When kids are in ISS, they don't learn what is being taught and they're the ones who are getting bad grades because they don't get or do the assignments. The teachers spend more time telling people to pull up their masks and talking about it than they do teaching. 
Students are the ones being punished for exercising their First Amendment right, freedom of speech. If the students speak up or try to not take a mask or not pull it all the way up, they get targeted by other students and teachers for expressing their own opinions. Everyone should be able to have their own opinions and choice and express it and express it if it doesn't interfere with theirs or any other anyone else's learning. And teachers should encourage and respect that. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Our next speaker is Annette Rose. She told me she would laugh at me if I tried. So I have these for you because I have a lot of numbers and I want you to be able to hear what I'm saying. Is that okay? Just one of these. Ask the right question. Sorry, I'm shaking. You want to give it to Patty? She can just hand them out. Oh. <coughs> <laughs> and I actually brought these. I've read this book. I didn't reading. put those for everybody. I only printed one copy of those. Okay. Oh, wait. Sorry. I have one for you. You don't get my number. Okay. Okay, so will this work better if I'm like actually in the microphone, you guys? Yes. Okay. Here are some proven facts. There are 50 million school-aged children between the ages of 5 to 18 in the United States. Between January 2020 and November 2021, almost a two-year period, there were 1.9 million cases of COVID in that age range of 5 to 18. Of those 1.9 cases, there were 94 deaths. Of those 94 deaths, all of those children had severe pre-existing conditions like cancer, genetic defects, cystic fibrosis, etc. In 2020, there was a 9% decline of deaths for all causes. That means that amidst a global pandemic of COVID-19, there was a decrease in deaths in school-aged children. This is all per the CDC's website. I don't know if you're aware of that. The actual percentage of deaths from COVID among school-aged kids is 0 0.000018. That number has a decimal point and five zeros in front of a one. It's barely even a number. It's literally one in a million. In December, Germany reported that between March 2020 and May 2021, no healthy child between the ages of five to 18 died from COVID, not one. Even in children with severe pre-existing conditions, that there were only one out of six there were only six out of 10 million school-aged children and teens that died from COVID. The odds that a healthy child between the ages of five to 11 would require intensive care for COVID is one in 50,000. One in 1.5 million children under 18 who did get COVID, only 14 died. Eight were infants and all had severe pre-existing conditions. British researchers have also found the same evidence. Out of 12, mil 12 million children under 18, only six have died from COVID. All of them also had severe pre-existing health conditions. If you are healthy and under the age of 70, you have less than a 1% chance of dying. Less than 1%, that is a fact, and a one in a million chance of dying if under, under 18. With those kind of odds, why are we forcing our kids to wear masks seven hours a day? This is not March 2020. We have so much more information then than we did back then. Now. We have to be able to take a look at the facts and make decisions that are actually in the best interest of our children. I get that there are people that get their facts from the media and they don't actually believe, and they do actually believe they're going to die from COVID, but that is a false narrative. The fact that depending on if your state is red or blue basically tells you if you have a mask mandate for children or not, tells us if this is political. Any person, young or old, has had the opportunity to be vaccinated. Ms. No Rose, one needs your, protection. Ms. Rose, your time is, your time is okay, expired. Just like two seconds. No one needs protection from the unvaccinated. Our unvaccinated kids do not need to wear masks. They do not need to test. They are healthy. Let them live, let them breathe. I get that there's so much information and misinformation coming from all sides. We have to do our best and sort through it to make the decisions that are in the best interest of the children. The only win-win is to allow choice, choice for students and choice for parents. So I will stop there. You can read the rest. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Our next speaker is Jared Bloxham. My name is Jared Bloxham and I'm the proud father of a Southridge sophomore. I would like to address how the administration at Southridge High School approached a group of students who were peacefully expressing their opposition to the perpetual mask mandate in their school. 
These young adults had determined for themselves without parental direction that the benefits of wearing a mask were no longer outweighing the effects it was having on them. These students went to school without masks. The administration had been informed that this was going to happen. And we're anticipating it. When the students got to the school, they were asked to move to the auditorium where they were confronted by staff and administration. I've listened to 20 minutes of recording during the discussion between staff, administration, and students, and I've met with both students and administration. As soon as the students voiced their opposition to being forced to wear a mask, they were immediately responded to with coercive and threatening language where they were told they would be suspended and face emergency expulsion. Several students reacted to this intimidation by replacing their masks and returning to class. It was not until a student questioned the coercion and intimidation as the initial steps, and another administrator came with a calmer demeanor and reasonable attitude that the coercion and intimidation were tabled. I asked the administration during our conversation if at any time anyone had taken a moment to ask these young adults what their concerns were and why they were doing this. There was an awkward pause and the answer that followed was a sheepish no. It was clear that this had not even been taken into consideration. They were merely treated as defiant punk kids that dared to question authority and must be punished. What the administration failed to recognize or question are the serious social, emotional, and psychological effects of perpetual mask mandates on some of our children. The science does not indicate a benefit that outweighs the risks in this age group by mandating masks. 43 states have recognized this and do not mandate mask wearing in schools. These young adults do recognize these effects. They feel them and face them every day. These kids have been taught to think independently and critically while respecting the thoughts and wishes of others. They have been doing so for a very long time now during this pandemic. It was very clear that the staff and administration held the viewpoint that you do it because we said to do it, because we've been told to do it, and because we are doing it, or at least outwardly appearing to do so. I have never parented with the because I said so mentality with good purpose and reason. It demeans and prohibits independent critical thought. I would hope that we are educating these young adults to be critical and independent thinkers. When they pose a question, whether verbally or by action, why are we doing this? It doesn't seem to make sense. I would hope they'd be met with more than because we said so and coercion and intimidation by those we entrust to educate our children. I expect better. These young adults expect better. The staff and administration should expect better of themselves. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker is Marianne Bloxham. Hello. I'm quoting this, public education is a right granted to all children in our area. It is the duty and responsibility of the KSD board to ensure our children's education is the best possible. Our guiding principle in all decisions must be keep kids first. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Because Mr. Connors, this is in your biography. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you tonight, how are you keeping our kids first? As you stated, how are you ensuring their best education possible? I have a study that I've given to Patty that was done by some medical doctors from USC. They all have PhDs. And the copy of their EO is what I gave and I have the full study with all the information, um, just one copy because it's 70 pages. Um, I'm quoting from that tonight. Benefits of masks in preventing serious illness or death from COVID-19 among children are extremely small. At the same time, they are disruptive to learning and communication in classrooms. They may be particularly partially effective shielding adults from COVID, but since when is it ethical to burden children for the benefit of adults? The long-term harm to kids from masking is potentially enormous. Masking is psychological stressor for children and disrupts learning. Covering the lower half of the face of both teacher and pupil reduces the ability to communicate. Children lose the experience of mimicking expressions, a central tool of nonverbal communication. Positive emotions such as laughing and smiling become less recognizable and negative emotions get amplified. Bonding between teachers and students takes hits. It's likely that masking exacerbates, I'm sorry, exacerbates, I'm sorry, my tongue is tied tonight, the chances that a child will experience anxiety and depression, which are already at pandemic levels themselves. So why are adults insisting on masking school children? Put it simple, it's about self-preservation. Children may not be particularly vulnerable, but they can spread the virus to others. Today, adults have no reason to put their safety ahead of the well-being of school kids. And that's the end of quote. You may say your hands are tied, but your voices are not. Speak up for our kids. You are our children's voices. I am a paraeducator at the school and I see what goes on. 
I challenge you for the next, not the next day, not the next week, but the next month that you do not take your mask off while you are at work for eight hours. Do not take your mask off while you're sitting alone in your office. Box, you can take your mask up. off, um, one more sentence, for 35 minutes, just like their lunch break. And I challenge you to do that and see how it feels. Looks like Karma. Karma is our next speaker. There we go. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Karma and I go to Southridge High School. I would just like to thank the schools, the staff, the principal, the school board, and the superintendents. Thank you for teaching us to stay quiet. Thank you for putting us in our place and reminding us that it's our body, your choice. Thank you for teaching us to blindly follow authority and not teaching us to have our own opinions. Thank you for making our own decisions for us. Thank you for choosing money over us. That's about $3,057 per student at Southridge. Thank you for choosing your safety instead of fighting for the future of your students. Thank you for being selfish instead of fighting for us. We are your community. That's your children, your grandchildren, or your neighbors. Thank you for teaching us to be afraid of what we don't know. Teaching my teaching small children like my eight-year-old sister that the only way she will be safe and live is by covering her face with a dirty cloth mask all day. Thank you for teaching all of your students that it's okay to be self-conscious. I mean, we don't have to be confident in who we are or how we look because we can just hide behind a mask all day. Thank you for not teaching us self-love and how to be mentally healthy and happy. Thank you for not helping us gain the confidence to be ourselves. Thank you for not giving us the privilege to be able to know what our classmates and teachers actually look like. Thank you for not keeping us safe. On January 20th, that was last Thursday, there was a school shooter threat and a picture posted to the teachers. Later, one of my teachers had told me that if he hadn't made a bond with his students throughout the school year, he would not have been able to tell the difference between his student and the shooter. I know that we are really excited to be forced to wear masks six to seven hours a day, and in many cases, be forced to put something into our bodies that we don't want there. Thank you for making sure that we are all able to learn to the best of our abilities. Although masks make it difficult for many of us to breathe and focus. I know firsthand how difficult it can be. When I'm in class having a panic attack or a hot flash and it's difficult for me to breathe and stay calm, additionally worrying about a thick itchy mask is not what I want to be dealing with. I know for a fact that many other students go through the same problem every day. You say you love us, and you say you care about our futures and our mental health, so stop being selfish and show us. Lastly, I would like to thank you all for making our school lives miserable, so thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be Chad Fultz. I'm sorry? Mr. Fultz will not be speaking. Okay, our next uh, speaker will be McKenna Bloxham. My name is McKenna Bloxham. I graduated as valedictorian from Southridge High School in 2017 and have a sister currently attending Southridge High School. I dedicated the last four years of my life to studying microbiology with an emphasis on bacterial and viral pathogenesis, and I'm currently working on furthering my education with a master's degree. I am a product of the community I grew up in. This community has been my home. I would not be who I am today if I were not surrounded by teachers, friends, and most importantly, my parents who advocated for me. Through their examples, I learned to advocate for myself. Current students stand before you today advocating for themselves. This is a fight they cannot fight by themselves, though. Mr. Connors, your school board bio states, our guiding principle in all decisions must be to keep kids first. Together, we can accomplish great things. Please remember these words when you listen to these students today. Choose to work together with them, alongside with them. Be their advocate, put them first. Ms. Sunvik, your bio states, I believe that we need to have school board members who have hands-on experience with the day-to-day -day activities, operations, and needs of the district students. 
maybe consider walking in these student shoes, put on a mask for seven hours a day with no breaks for two years and tell me how it goes. Tell me how your mental and physical health is and tell me if you still think it should be a requirement to stay masked. You go on to say, school board decisions should come from well thought out. Um, school board decisions should come from well thought out and researched information in which the community has been involved and listened to with great care. We are members of your community. Listen with care to us. Be involved, let, allow us to be involved in these decisions and be a voice for the community you represent. I hope that these words in your bios become much more than just words on a paper or screen. Turn these words into action. Show the students you truly do care and that being a member of the school board isn't just something you are doing to add to a list of accomplishments. Show them you are doing it because you care for their well-being. Board members, your job is to advocate for the best interests of the students. Use the voice voters had given you to advocate for these students. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker will be Lena Gregory. Is that correct? Tina. Tina, I'm sorry. Thank you. Masks don't work to stop the spread of viruses. The CDC has made this very clear. The cause, they cause mental and psychological damage. UK, Norway, Denmark, all have stopped unlawful mandates. You, New York Supreme Court ruled they are unconstitutional. The risks outweigh the benefits. We're gripped by fear, insult others that don't agree. This lie that mass work has caused more fear. Everyone needs to be afraid of everything. Be obedient and wear your mask. Be afraid of that other person that's not sick, but might get you sick. Where is the science with these lies? We're created to become immune to illnesses. We are creating an environment of massive sanitizer. Stay out of my bubble. Better immunity comes by facing sickness. Our children won't be able to touch their children or parents. The CDC is to blame for this virus. They created and patented it in a lab. They love to push their fear and lies. None of them are actually following through with what they pushed. They are exempt to vaccinations, lockdowns, and masks. This pandemic was created by pushing sick people into homes, false tests, and no treatments. Stay home until you're deadly ill. What kind of medical treatment is this? No one is allowed to treat the symptoms. Gates, Schwab, Plan to depopulize the world is right on track. They create viruses, lockdowns, little minions follow right to our graves. These precious years of our children's lives cannot be given back. They should be playing, sharing, and developing their own thoughts and ideas. Children can throw a fit and we empty the whole class. We can't discipline them. We can force them to wear a useless mask though. In the past, our kids with the flu had to push through it. Now sniffling, oh, it's COVID. We don't have any other sicknesses. Our children are the least affected by this virus. 99.9999 survivable. We can't say the same with these experimental vaccinations. I know this has been really hard. It's a hard job for you guys. I'm asking you to seek peer review, seek this information these people are giving you. This is something our governor and That's health great. department won't do. There are many studies that have proved masks are ineffective. They are causing more great. issues. Our children are turning more to drugs and suicide. And no, my mask will not keep you from getting sick. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Rachel. Rachel Sambrano. I'm turning on my machine really quick. Okay. Could we have somebody hop in front of Rachel it's while on. she's? It's oh, on. Here we go. 
Here we go. <clears throat> this monitors air, clean air. So construction sites. Okay, right now we are on clean air. Clean air, green, right? I'm gonna just set this right here because I'm a little nervous. This is what you are breathing. This is what your children are breathing eight hours a day. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, six, one thousand, seven, one thousand, eight, one thousand, nine, one thousand. I can sit up here all day. This will not turn off. This will not turn off. I'll remind the audience to please refrain from participating. Why? This is a proof. This is proof right here. And it's shameful. It's shameful. You should not do this to your kids. You should not do this to you. Okay, our next speaker is Brock Harris. My name is Brock Harris and I go to Southridge and I'm in 11th grade. We are fed up with losing our rights and freedoms in the school. We have to wear a mask for seven hours a day and can't breathe well. We are healthy students with little to no risk. We should have the choice to wear a mask or not. We are here as kids to call out the inconsistencies of our leaders who claim to care about our safety. How does it make sense that you write us during the school hours to wear masks and during the school week? But on game day, it's a free for all. 90% of the students are maskless. However, how is this safe in your mind? If you believe the masks are there to protect us, then why would you allow this to happen at the games? Obviously, it shows major inconsistency and hypocrisy to the youth. You have lost all credibility with the students in this school, and you have failed to be real leaders. The trade-off for the diploma is no longer worth the indoctrination and discrimination it comes with. We understand that your only option is to double down on your story because to admit that this is all nonsense would be to admit that you ruined people's lives, people's businesses, and many will never recover. As a young man, I will rally, rally others. There are thousands behind me and we will never forget this. You will go down as the mindless tyrants of our generation. Obedience is not a virtue. Thank you, Brock. The next speaker will be Danica Galbraith. Hi, my name is Danica Galbraith and I'm a junior at Southridge. I've been sent home two times in the past four days. This is because I refused to wear my mask on Friday and didn't pull my mask up when asked on Monday. I was asked, I was kept in the auditorium with other students on Friday and was threatened with suspension if I didn't comply. I did not be, end up being suspended, but I was sent home with an excused absence. Same situation on Monday. I was told to pull my mask up and I kindly said, no, thank you. I was sent to Ms. Hamburger Teal's office, the principal at Southridge, and ended up, ended up being sent home with another excused absence. Why can't I learn without being bothered about my mask? Um, where is the empathy from our staff? Why is it the same three to five students being sent to the office are being sent home? I feel my school doesn't want to have to deal with us, so they just send us home. Is that how you want us to feel? Just like another body in the hallway? If you want us to feel that way, you're doing great. Okay, our next speaker will be Asha Vaughn. Hi, my name is Asha Vaughn and I'm a sophomore at Southridge High School. I've been sent home two days for not wearing my mask. When they asked me to put on my mask or put it over my nose, I politely say, no, thank you. Then they proceed to send me to the office and try to send me home. There are steps in between asking to put on my mask and going straight home, which they are not doing. I feel like I should be able to go 
go to class and get educated without having something covering my face. We should have the choice to, to decide whether we have to wear this mask or not. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Our next speaker will be uh, Benacio Garcia. Yes, good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Benaz Garcia III. I am running for U.S. Congress for Congressional District. And one of the reasons why I'm also running, why I'm here tonight, is because our freedoms are being taken away. And first and foremost, I would love all our youth to please stand up right now. Yeah. Please. <laughs> you want to know what inspires me? It is them taking and knowing that their freedoms are being taken away right now at this moment. That as parents and me as a grandparent haven't stood enough and strong enough to keep those freedoms free. I'll tell you this month we celebrate a great American, Dr. Martin Luther King. We celebrate the 17th of January. There were two things that were very incredible on his speech of, 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 of dream. Number one was civil rights. Second was the economic oppression. And these laws have economically oppressed 1,800 state employees. And not only that, but have oppressed each person working under the school district or for the state. Those that, that is true. Not including that we got an administration like Biden and we got a governor that don't truly understand our constitution. In every aspect of our Constitution, which is given to us by the Spirit of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost, now I'm running God, family, country, it is inspired, and our founders knew that those freedoms came, not by big government, not by government, not by tyranny, but those came from our Creator. And so I want to acknowledge each of these young students right here standing up that they truly understand what freedom is. And what is sad is that our government, especially those that are working in it today, have decided to choose money over freedom and have decided to choose money and job positions over our great youth right now. So God bless you, our youth. I will be fighting for you all the way through. God bless your parents. God bless our family. And there is an accountability in the state and federal government, because those are federal funds that are coming in, and not all that, but review your McClure Elite decision. Okay, our next speaker is Lenoa Trump-Trump-Trumpur. Linda. Linda, I'm sorry. Kennewick School District has received $58,700,000 as an incentive to enforce the mask and vaccine mandates because mandates are not laws and Inslee cannot make laws. Mask and vaccine mandates have nothing to do with health. It's about money. The laws to this subject, as I have read, making anybody participate in an experimental program using coercion is illegal. Under Code 21 of Federal Regulations, Section 50, 23 and 24, it is illegal to make anybody participate in an experimental program using coercion. This is a civil violation of the law. The COVID vaccines have not been out long enough not to be experimental. By enforcing these mandates, masks and vaccines in your schools, Tracy Pierce, your superintendent, is using coercion. All of you and the Board of Education are using coercion by not objecting to the mask and vaccine coercion practices in this school system. You should be actively involved in stopping this. Thomas Jefferson once said, if we are, if we are to guard against ignorance and remain free, it is the responsibility of every American to be informed. I have heard that the uh, insurance for the superintendents have a deductible and some of the deductibles are 40 grand. 
Everyone who participates in this unlawful act of coercion in this school system may find themselves in similar consequences depending on the long-term effects of all of this. The parents here tonight have the ability to sue Tracy Pierce, Pierce your board and the Board of Education as boards and severally, meaning individually. We are two years into COVID and masks. The documentation from scientists all over the world and the US are against the use of masks and vaccines to fight this virus because they don't work. They are harming people, killing people and maiming people. Good, healthy nutrition practices, healthy behaviors, exercise without masks, fresh air, sunshine, hydration are all the things that we need to be doing to protect ourselves from the many viruses that hit our nation, not masks and vaccines. Ma all right. Your time is up. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Seth Barnett. Is that correct? He was with some Barnett? sports kids. No. I do not see. Is he left? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, okay, our next speaker will be Jojo Davis. I feel like I'm going to give you a little break from masks for just two minutes and I practice so hopefully I'll be in two minutes but I'm here to talk to you about the mental health therapists that are needed in middle schools. This is a time period that there is the greatest developmental gaps, the greatest identity issues and middle school students are bombarded with messages that they don't have the emotional or mental capacity to process correctly. Currently, the Kennewick School District, we only have mental health therapists in the high school and the elementary. Kids in trauma that are at our, our school, Highlands, they experience trauma at home, drug, alcohol abuse by parents and siblings, abuse, sexual abuse, human trafficking is huge in the Tri-Cities and Highlands is hit hard by this topic. We have eating disorders and as well as our behavior program kids that come to us as sixth graders from a behavior program in elementary where they have one-on-one -on -one and sometimes two-on-one -on -one paras. Board, I need you to understand those programs and paras don't come with them as sixth graders. We are left as a staff to try and do this all on our own. We used to have the Lord's Day program, phenomenal program that helps so many of our kids. It is gone. Not surprisingly, kids experiencing trauma monopolize counselor and administration time. What they need is denied to them. We've asked for help. We've been told to wait, but wait for what? To see more hurt? The impacted kids are continuing to hurt. Their behavior impacts other students who see the follow-up out of that hurt. Sometimes violence and aggression comes out of this trauma. Staff who feel unsafe because of some of the students. Community who expects us to work miracles with we no resources. Rumor has it a program is coming and we're told again to wait. Wait and watch the hurt grow. This program is not just for behavior kids, it's for your kids, it's for all the kids that need that extra help. And before someone twists it, it's not a COVID created pro problem. This is a problem that has been decades in the making in the Kennewick School District. Thank you for the high school mental health therapist, but don't stop there. Middle school needs them more than ever. I'm begging you to get this help. I'm begging you not to ignore this. My time is over, but I want to thank publicly. Gabe, thank you for reaching out to our principal. You're the only one that I know of that took my invitation last month, because every month you're going to see this face. But Gabe, thank you. I know it had to be rescheduled, but please, board, please come and see Highland. Come see those kids and walk the halls. Thank you. OK, that is the end of our public speakers this evening. Thank you very much for your input. <clears throat> OK, uh, next on our agenda is consent items. Uh, I will entertain a motion to accept the consent items. I move to accept the consent items as written. I'll second that. I have a first and a second. Uh, can I get a roll call vote, please? Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next on our list is superintendent and board member reports. 
I will hand it over to Dr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Connors. I will actually um, wait and include my report as part of the report that I'm going to give. So, okay. uh, but, but okay. um, Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to give us a report. Yep, I got a brief. Thank you all. So I've done um, a lot with WASDA recently. We've had three student rep network meetings from across the state. We're working to uh, accumulate a list of recommendations and a list of best practices, both to provide students, both to provide to student reps and boards on how this policy and how this position looks in the state and kind of uh, provide districts that don't necessarily have this position uh, a building blocks to, to make it and then districts can um, iterate thereof. Uh, we got a meeting discussing legislative session and we're uh, they're doing a really good job of keeping us informed in the legislative process uh, that's happening in the short session. And we got to meet with the executive director of WASDA and kind of understand what his mission statement is and, and uh, the ways that they see students uh, engaging with WASDA. I was asked to speak in a few different areas. I was asked to speak at the WASDA Legislative Legislative Committee. They form uh, the, uh, the ways that uh, the uh, WASDA is going to advocate um, in the executive session based on the voting, I believe from General Assembly that happened a few months ago. Uh, Jill Oldson, the president for, uh, from Richland School District is on that committee. Um, I was asked to be a part of uh, two of the four students uh, to record videos during the WASDA, WASA, WASVO, a lot of acronyms there, legislative conference. Um, and I was asked to kind of speak on the importance of uh, additional staffing allocations and social emotional supports and the importance of student voice. Um, I was asked to testify on behalf of WASDA on Senate Bill 5798, which expands the community eligibility uh, provision, I believe is what the P stands for, um, which long story short uh, was a program that is in about 19 or 20 of our schools that provides universal free meals for all students in that school. Um, and again, long story short, this bill would rework the funding model such that every school in Kenwick School District would qualify for universal free meals. So it would have a really big impact on our students if it does pass. Keeping a keen eye on it, but uh, I was asked to testify uh, Mr. Schick from the Director of Nutritional Services, like that same day, offered to uh, give me a Zoom so I could really understand with him and walk through what the implications of this bill were. So just a huge thanks, thanks to him and Dr. Pierce's team for helping me uh, with that process. Um, and then the OSPI later that day uh, shared the video of my testimony, so that was pretty cool. Um, I got to meet uh, a while ago, but uh, haven't been had a report in a bit uh, with Dr. Pierce and Mr. Anderson. We just kind of discussed the position and what it looks like moving forward. Um, and I've shared that I have felt extremely supported from the district and this board. So I thank all of you for that. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I wrote this in here too. Um, from the student rep network, I think this district does one of the best jobs in that network. Uh, of supporting this position. So that's a huge thank you to all of you. I feel very lucky to be a part of this district. Um, I got to meet with local legislators alongside Mr. Connors and, and Ms. Sunvik. It was great to hear from them and hear what their priorities were for the legislative session and get to hear what the board's uh, uh, priorities were and then what my priorities were. So a lot of great opportunities there. We didn't have a SAC or Student Superintendent Advisory Council, but uh, Dr. Pierce extended the next one, so I'll be excited to update you on that when that comes. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So again, I've got to remind the audience, you guys have to wear your masks. I know you hate it. I'm sorry. In order for us to continue the meeting, we have to have everyone put masks on. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, other reports? Dave, I'll, yeah. start, I'll start down there. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So I recently, the last two weeks, I went out and visited six of our schools, high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. And I will tell you, um, I was impressed by actually what I saw in the schools. Um, the teachers are doing a great job working with the resources that they have. The students are engaged. Um, and it was, it was great to see and get to go through some of these schools and, and see how we are doing. I will say I was disappointed because the one thing I did not see 
in six of these schools, unfortunately, was a smile. So um, we'll be out. Maybe next time we'll we'll get a chance to see it. Um, additionally, uh, the last few weeks, um, this past, I believe it was this past year, um, there was a, a group of superintendents who uh, wrote a letter to the governor um, asking that they, uh, I believe, make masks optional. Um, and so in partnership with a school board member in Richland, Audra Bird, we have authored a letter individually. We have now 150 school board directors across the state who have signed on to that letter to make masks optional. And we will be sending that to the governor and, and uh, Superintendent Reichdahl uh, this Friday. So that represents 10% of the school district uh, school directors in the state, as well as 30% of the school boards in the state. So um, we're trying to make our voice heard and, and uh, that's what I'm, I've been working on. So and I look forward to getting out to more schools uh, here shortly. So. Thank you. Micah, do you have anything? Yes, I do. I've also been visiting schools. Um, I've been spending a significant amount of time in schools. And I will say that we are absolutely living in a pandemic. Our job is to protect kids. And there is a true pandemic happening. We have an urgent matter at hand right now, yet those who feel the urgency also feel ignored. The true pandemic is actually harming our kids. That's actually harming our kids it's isolation, anxiety, depression, self-harm, fear, lack of learning, and lack of intellectual development. We need to protect our kids from what is actually damaging them. And statistically, it is not COVID. For the past two years, Americans have, have accepted more harm to children in exchange for less harm to adults. Cases are rising, harm is not. There are about 73 million kids in the United States from zero to 17. The risk of hospitalization is well documented, is well, well, well below 1%. <clears throat> Nationwide, there were 180 deaths from COVID according to the CDC on, in 2020. In 2019, there are 434 deaths from the flu from 2019. So almost three times is more for the flu, but we didn't do this kind of stuff. There were 233 deaths from COVID last year from the age demographic, zero to 17. There were, by contrast, 128 deaths from school bus accidents. So you're almost as many school bus accidents as COVID deaths. We don't even think twice as to take our kids in school buses, do we? About 3,000 deaths from total from car accidents, or 30,000 in 2020. In Washington, most school board directors don't even know this stat. It's pretty amazing, but there have actually been 10 deaths of youth since the start of the pandemic. 10 in the state of Washington. In 2021, guess how many deaths there were from pneumonia? 30. We had 30 deaths from pneumonia last year, and we've had 10 deaths from COVID since the, history, since the beginning of the pandemic. Statistically speaking, your child has a better chance to play in the NBA than to die of COVID. We prefer, we are, we are giving preference to an unknown hypothetical, hypothetical fear over known facts. 70, this, is, this should be telling 75% of COVID deaths, those kids had four or more comorbidities. I, like I said, I have been in schools. I've been spending a significant amount of time in schools and I'm visiting with these counselors. You know what they tell you? Mental health issues is the issue. Mental health. We are living in a pandemic, but, but we're ignoring the pandemic is what's happening. We are putting our heads in the sand and we are ignoring the pandemic that's right in front of our eyes. Kids carry the burden that they will somehow kill people if they don't have their masks on. Do you think that creates anxiety? What does fighting for mental health look like to us? Can we agree? My proposal is can we agree on something to, to move the ball forward? I know that masks aren't going to come off tomorrow, but we can still agree on something to improve mental health. Our community is obviously divided. So what I'm proposing is that we come up with the lowest common denominator and the standard for schools to follow that's consistent that we can all agree on and present a united front. I have four ideas. I want to quickly go through them and I'll be done. But first we have to recognize and acknowledge the true pandemic in front of us. My first proposal is a declaration encouraging masks to be not worn outside. I've been in schools and I'll tell you what, every single 
every single educator, every single principal and vice principal and staff, they all have their masks on tight and half the kids do too. This is not healthy. I was a college athlete. I broke records and, and I played soccer around the world. I, I broke records in, in track and I'm also a mountain climber. And one thing that those two disciplines recognize is your VO2 max, your ability for your uh, body to assimilate oxygen. And I can tell you that when you're running hard and you're trying to do math in your head, for example, you don't, you're not, you don't know how the capability to do it because your body and your muscles are using up that oxygen. There, when you climb mountains, you get to a certain elevation and there's that called the death zone where your body starts to literally die because you're not really running out of oxygen. We need to, we need to encourage it. One of the, another teacher told me, uh, one lady told me to put on my mask outside, which is not a rule, but that's what they were instructing me to do. Another uh, principal or vice principal told me to, that he has his N95 mask on outside to show an example. I think that is a terrible example. What you're doing is teaching kids that, that that's healthy to have a mask on outside and it is not. It's healthy to breathe air. That's what's healthy. It's healthy to develop antibodies. That's what's healthy. My second declaration is preventative health. All we talk about is setting a vaccine vaccination station. But what about giving the 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 underprivileged vitamin D and and vitamin C and zinc? Why one of the other things that these counselors tell me is that we're cutting out PE. Why are we cutting out PE with cardiovascular and heart health are one of the most important elements to fighting COVID? Why are we cutting out PE in our schools? Why are we resisting sports and dances? And I'm glad we're going to talk about soon up on the agenda lunches because I just don't feel like eating the corn dog and cutting down PE and and not teaching about vitamins and health is the way to stop a pandemic. <laughs> Number three, Number three, parents in schools. We need parents in schools. We need to pr present a united front that we have a mission to get parents in schools every single day. God gave kids to the families, not to the state. Yeah. Declaration number four, I want to loosen local restrictions, including testing. I, I think we need to loosen those. And, that, and people are going to say that we do not have re local restrictions, but we do. I listened to Dr. Deborah Persons yesterday speak about restrictions that she has in place because she's not comfortable. She also said that our hospitals are not even close to the red zone right now, which is something that people are saying is not even true, according to our Benton County Frank or Benton Franklin County Health Director. Uh, my thing is, is, what can we do together to fight the real pandemic, which is mental illness? What can we do as a board to uh, gather to agree on it? And, and you have what's the lowest common denominator we can all agree on. Thank you. Okay, Diane, you have a report? Thank you. Um, so I was with Zachary and Dr. Pierce and Mr. Connors when we met with our um, eighth LD people and um, it was nice to have people ask Zachary specifically for his um, input on that. So I did appreciate having him there. Um, and I was also able to watch Zachary when he was talking about the CEP um, lunch when I was watching on TVW. So again, he's, um, I'm, I'm very proud of him, but he also speaks very eloquently for all of the students in our district. So I do appreciate that. Um, Dr. Pierce and I were at the, um, Michael, were you at the ESD regional meeting? Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, Micah and Dr. Pierce and I were at the regional ESD um, annual board meeting where they just give us a lot of information about uh, legislature and what we can do. Um, let's see. Key Connections, which is our youth. We um, work with Ben Franklin Youth on um, drug and alcohol. And um, one of their people now has come to our district and is working directly in our district. and. And uh, they appreciate very much the work that we do together with one another. Um, and then just as the legislative person, I've been watching a lot of, um, of the House bill and Senate bill uh, types of things that are going on. One is our um, funding for, we were talking about mental health, um, funding for nurses, uh, social workers, school psychologists, um, and counselors. And that um, looks like it may happen for us this year. Right now, we, for example, for nurses, Dr. Pierce, you can help me if I'm not correct on this. We have the money for three, we, four from the state. We get enough money for four nurses from the state. And the, the other, 
however many 15, 14, 16, 16 um, pays already. for out of local levy funds. And so hopefully we can get more money for that. Enrollment stabilization funding, which is uh, one of our number one, and transportation, I think was number two on our board priority to restore uh, funding from previous uh, times. And then one of the ones that I follow uh, pretty much is our highly capable um, students so we can have more uh, funding for our highly capable programs, which has been cut and dual credit program costs. Hopefully they will be cutting some of the, just the additional fees for books and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And K-12 funding, which we always ask. <laughs> we always need more money for K-12 funding. And it looks like maybe the Senate has a plan that will make some of that happen for us. So if anybody's interested in the specifics, please let me know. Thank you. Mr. Mabry, you have anything? I do not have anything else to add. Perfect. Nor do I. Okay, so we will move on to reports and discussions. Uh, first on the up for discussion is staff safety report. Molly Lutz will be uh, presenting. I got it. Yeah, thank you. Good evening and thank you for having me. My name is Molly Lutz. I do safety and loss prevention. Um, and then tonight we're sp I'm specifically talking about staff safety. The staff goal is that all of our staff members are safe, respected and valued professionals and we're working in safe and positive environments. The focus tonight is going to focus on three targets. It's going to be on safety training, our OSHA recordable injuries, and accepted claims. A little bit of history for workers' compensation. Who pays for our claims? For things like the medical one, who pays for time loss? And our district collects premiums from our employees. And that we manage the program premiums, and we want to make sure that we have adequate cash reserves uh, for the ex expected and outstanding claims. We have quarterly payments and assessments that are made to LNI. And other costs include our third party claims administrator service to make sure that we're adhering to the expectations of our program, safety program related costs for things like training and the, the claims themselves when it comes to doctor visits, physical therapy, equipment, and any disability time or time loss. The performance indicators and targets. This one is the safety training. And what we use is we use safe schools and safe schools is a blended learning module. We can tailor it for the specific jobs that people do in the district. These are between about five and 20 minutes. Some of it's video, some of it's specific district policy. And what it is is the people that we're hiring, we want them to know how to be safe and how to report safety incidents. And even though our goal was 96%, 99.97 have now completed their training. And this is not just our teachers and our paraeducators. These are our coaches. These are volunteer coaches. And it's having people that are working with our kids trained safely to begin with. The next focus is on our three year rolling average for OSHA recordables. We want it to be less than 40 injuries. A recordable claim is something that is complex. It is a measure of severity. So this is something where we have people that need either multiple doctor visits or may have restricted work, may be written off of work. So these are ones we really want to minimize. This year, this past year, there were 52 recordable claims. And while that is significant, it still keeps our three year rolling average to 38 and, and below our goal of 40. The next question we ask not only how many, but then who is injured? And this helps me focus and work with specific groups to try and keep these severe injuries from happening. You can see from the from our numbers from 2014 to present um, last year that we had our higher numbers in the teacher in the MO category. So may I ask what MO? Yeah. Right. Maintenance and operation. Oh, maintenance and operation. Thank yep, you. so these would be our crafts people. Perfect. Thank you. And then not only who was injured, but what kind of injuries? Um, are they contact injuries? Are they, is that, would that be something similar to contusions 
or lacerations. Um, is it over overexertion, something similar to repetitive motion, carpal tunnel, or is it going to be the slip trips and falls? Days on time loss are really important because we want to, we want to minimize the time away from people's contracted jobs. We need to have staff in classrooms doing the jobs that they were hired for us. It's so important for that. And out of the 52 recordable claims, only six claims had time loss paid. And even with that 37, so that's an average of about six days. But even then there were six people that were unable to be at work for a week because of their injury. We have a robust return to work program and we keep we bring people back to do work. It's so it's healthy for them. It's better for the kids. It's better for the schools. The last target I'd like to talk about is our three year rolling average for the accepted claims and accepted claims are an indicator of frequency. We don't want to have someone be injured three and four times. We don't want to have if there's something that needs to be fixed. We want to know about it. We want to correct it immediately. Last year we had 112 claims, which is significantly larger than what we've had in the past. Even, a, even though we have five time loss claims, um, best medical practice is 80% medical only and 20% time loss. And so while we are beating best practices, we do want to reduce the number of accepted claims. This claim, is, this slide is something that you saw earlier. Um, it usually comes out in the spring. Time frame is May 1st through April 30th, and this is our three year rolling average for our school year and who was injured. And you'll see that this is this still meets uh, our goal uh, 38. Do you have any questions for me? Could you go back one slide? I'm, sure. I'm just trying to see how, do we have a trend and I'm not saying we do. I just didn't see it. Do we have an upward trend, a downward trend or? Are we straight uh, straight line in? Um, let's see, 20, 21, 30. It's, the, it's not consistently decreasing, but it's not consistently increasing right. either. Okay. So. That's good. okay, thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask about the injuries? So we, we, have, we have 52 total injuries. Correct. Looks like uh, the teacher category and the MNO are higher um, right. than they've been in the past. Have we identified any issues that may have caused those? Like, are these slip trips and falls? And then have we looked into these to make sure that we're we have some sort of action plan or something to make sure we are looking out for that? Right? Like, Correct. if someone slips and falls, like, do we like do training on like walking like a penguin on ice or mm -hmm. whatever you, you would do? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and actually we do, part of it's in safe schools, so they get it um, either through in the video. And then in the fall, I work specifically with slips, trips and falls. I send out um, emails for the Yaks tracks. Those are the over the shoe ones. And so anyone um, can request Yaks tracks and those are purchased to try and reduce the slips, trips and falls. And um, it makes it a little bit challenging. Some of it's on like wet grass and the Yaks tracks aren't going to help on that. But you're right, this is what I do. I work really closely um, when we're looking at these numbers. And you'll see that there's an extra column in there for life skills. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a specific fo spoke, focus that I have a special services. And we go through and there's an extra survey that's sent out when it's a life skills industry and so injury so that we can address that quickly if it's a PPE issue or if it's something that we can help with. But you're right for crafts when we look at that and it's if it's a vehicle accident or if it's equipment malfunction, uh, that is something that I work closely with. Great, thank you. And then I also just want to say uh, there's a lot of numbers on here, but that 99.97% is outstanding. So good job okay. on the safe schools. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if we can get them trained to begin with, if we that's that's our great, that's the best way to do it is to proactive. Yep. Wonderful. Any other questions? Wonderful. Thank you so much for the presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Thank okay. you. Great okay, uh, next on the agenda is a COVID-19 updates. Dr. Pierce and Bronson Brown will be presenting.
Okay, uh, before I get started into the details of the report tonight, I did want to take just a few minutes to share some words I prepared to express appreciation for our hardworking team here in our district and in our schools. Uh, we are truly fortunate to have amazing district and school staffs, classified staff, certificated staff, administrators working in our schools in our district who care deeply about students and public education. People who have dedicated their entire lives to serving children, young people, families, and our community. Navigating COVID-19 and this whole situation that we're gonna update you on this evening, as a staff um, over the past two years and continuing to navigate it today, is a challenge that none of us signed up for and none of us asked for. I heard someone say tonight they hate COVID. I think that's something that we can all agree on. When the governor closed schools in 2020, the district team here, our schools, our teachers, our staff, our administrators, everyone worked to shift to remote learning at a time when no one even knew what remote learning meant. We work to get technology in the hands of our students and our families. We work to continue to provide food for students and to plan for providing continued instruction. When the state released the requirements needed to be in place to bring students back to hybrid learning, principals and school staffs worked tirelessly to rearrange classrooms we bought new furniture, we moved, we, we moved the ends of the earth, whatever needed to be done to implement a myriad of safety requirements imposed by the state, required by the state, needed to bring our students back to in-person learning and to keep our students and staff safe. Last year, under the board's leadership, we were among the very first districts in the state to bring students back for full-time in-person instruction. And I'm very proud of that. This year, we continue to have to adhere to and implement, implement state laws that are in place for K-12 public education. The K-12 requirements from the State Department of Health continue to change regularly. In fact, we just got an update today. Our school staffs, our teams pivot quickly to implement the new requirements as they're coming down. It is not an easy task. We're focused on keeping our schools open for in-person learning. We know how important that is for our students. We're doing this amidst continual staffing shortages due to COVID and simultaneously we're faced with people that we know feel strongly that we're not doing enough to keep our students in school safe and people who I understand and empathize with who are frustrated about and oppose the COVID requirements and mask mandates. I know that board members received a number of emails today from people on both sides of this issue. So before I begin the report and outline again what the requirements are and, and what we're expected to do as a public school district in our state. I just want to take a few minutes to recognize our KSD staff members for their continued hard work and efforts. I know we have families and students who are frustrated and we heard from them tonight and I empathize with that. The mandates that are in place are not coming from the district administration, from our district staff or from our board. They're coming from the state. And as a public school district in Washington State, we're required to follow them. When I get on an airplane, I'm required to wear a mask. And I know that that mask requirement is coming from the FAA. It's not coming from the pilot. It's not coming from the flight crew. The pilot and the flight crew are trying to fly the plane and attend to the passengers. And I know that the pilot and the flight crew are doing the jobs they've been tasked to do. Similarly, our staff, our team here in KSD, 
in our district and in our schools are trying to do their jobs, our jobs, and trying to uphold the laws and requirements that we've been given by the state. And we have the legal and ethical responsibility to uphold. We're doing our best to keep our schools open for in-person learning for our students and to ensure that we receive the funding that we need to operate as a school district. It's not that it's all about the money. The reality is if we don't receive the money from the state, we can't operate our schools. And we're trying to do our best to focus on educating and providing all the opportunities that we're able to for our students in this very difficult time. I just needed to spend a couple of minutes to recognize our hardworking team here. I'm a proud superintendent of the team here in KSD. So I want to start the report tonight with uh, highlighting again for the board your shared priorities that you developed at our at the recent board retreat just a, a couple of weeks ago. And um, at that board retreat, board members uh, spent some time discussing what are your current priorities right now as a newly formed board and what are the shared areas of focus and interest. And so this should look super familiar to all of you because it was all charted on the chart paper that night uh, and I verbatim took it from the chart paper and kind of organized it and put it on this slide. So what you as our board members uh, focused on was student safety, understanding and navigating, navigating COVID, funding and student learning and performance. And I won't read to you, you can read on the screen, but these were the, the areas, the specifics that you all identified in these different areas. And so tonight, this report is an update and an opportunity for discussion, really focused on the understanding and navigating COVID, but we're gonna touch on other areas as well in terms of funding and student learning and performance, because these are all connected. So I just wanted to spend a minute to bring back to you what you've prioritized as a board um, in terms of kind of setting a context for the presentation tonight. So uh, in, in terms of an outline for the report to you, uh, I wanted to bring back to you the board shared current priorities that you identified. I want to share with you our staff focus priorities. Uh, right now they're aligned with your priorities as a board. I want to share with you the most recent updates uh, in terms of the state mandates that we have related to COVID-19 and the requirements and laws that are in place for K-12 schools. And our district legal counsel, Bronson Brown, is here tonight uh, to help answer questions that you might have as well. What I'd like to try to do is get through the, the presentation and then um, at the end uh, provide you know, opportunity for questions and answers from either Bronson or myself, and then of course the opportunity for board discussion. We're gonna talk through some of the funding and legal implications. I wanna to touch on, and this is information that you know, I, I believe, but um, touch on some areas related to local board authority and advocacy. And then of course, time for board discussion. So currently as a staff, and I touched on some of this already, but as a staff, as a team here on the uh, staff side of things, we're focused right now on ensuring student and staff safety. That's always a high priority, top priority. We're focused on keeping our schools open for in-person learning. It's really challenging right now because we're focused on in whatever ways we can uh, addressing the staff absence issue, which is related to COVID and positive COVID cases. And I've been sharing with you on a regular basis, the data in terms of student absences and staff absences. And so our focus is ensuring all those classes are covered so we can keep schools open for in-person learning. And then also addressing the student absences and trying to figure out how we can best support learning recovery, not just from uh, COVID previously during the school closures, but, but now as well as kids are out and so forth. Uh, we're, we're focused on ensuring that we are following the state requirements and that we're not imposing additional um, restrictions. And I have had board members contact me and ask about um, 
you know, like masks outside or those kinds of things. And and those are not masks aren't required outside. And so if there are, you know, what we're doing um, from the district administration side is making sure and clarifying that our buildings know what all of the rules are um, and, and not imposing additional uh, uh, restrictions. But of course, if people want to wear their mask outside, they absolutely can do that. We're focused on continuing to provide as much as we possibly can all the regular school opportunities and events for families and students as allowable by the state. Um, it was heartwarming to see all of our student athletes and esports participants and all of that tonight. And, and you heard uh, what, what everyone has had to go through to try to keep those opportunities going for kids and, and we're focused on that. And we are focused on, because we have to be, ensuring that we're getting adequate funding to meet the needs of our students and keep our schools and our programs fully operating. So I wanna take a few moments to just walk through the most recent updates. So uh, I was able to actually go back to some of the information that I reported to the board uh, at the time in August. Uh, about what are all the requirements and, and what are what are we being told as a school district by the state. So some of this will be a repeat and some of it might be new, but there's been updates since that time as well. So uh, first, and Mr. Connors alluded to this or spoke to it, you know, in terms of the board meeting requirements. So, you know, everybody knows the state secretary of health mask order. And, and that's an order that ho holds the um, authority of law. And the general requirement is, of course, indoor face coverings. And then there's very specific additional requirements um, that as an employer, we have to make sure are followed to keep staff safe and adhere to the LNI requirements, because if we don't adhere to those requirements, uh, you know, I think you all, you know, um, have worked or work in um, areas where there's complaints and, and liability and um, risk associated with not following those requirements that are designed to keep employees safe. And so part of the LNI requirements are masks as well. So I just clipped here um, that businesses are required to follow the face covering requirements in accordance with the Secretary of Health space sorry, Secretary of Health, yes, face covering, um, vaccinated or not in indoor public spaces. So that's L&I. So we're an employer and we're tasked with and required to follow those L&I requirements. In addition then, pardon me, on top of this, we've got specific K-12 public school requirements that we're required to follow. And those, um, as you can see, I want to point this out. I mentioned that they change regularly and they get updated and we have to pivot quickly and, and figure that out. So what you see is this first one was dated summer. It was for the summer 2021 and 21-22 school year. And then if you read downward, you can see all of the summary changes and they, they try to summarize those for us. But there's been updates in August, September, October, December, January. And so we're constantly shifting and trying to to determine what those are and how do we implement them so the mask requirement part is is right here that all school personnel volunteers visitors and students must wear well-fitting face coverings or an acceptable alternative which is a surgical mask or clear shield with a drape at school when indoors in accordance with the secretary of health's mask order and uh, staff who are verified to be fully vaccinated can be indoors without masks when students are not present or expected to be present. So that's that's what the rule is. And then of course, this requirements from the Department of Health that uh, also cover things like the isolation and quarantine requirements um, associated with positive cases or close contacts in schools, the testing program requirements, the screening testing program requirements for K-12 athletics and all the return to school and work requirements. So it's quite a hefty uh, lengthy document. This is just a screenshot of page one. Okay, I wanna speak for just a moment on vaccines and where we are with that. So we just kind of covered where we are with the mask mandate that is the state's mask mandate that we're required to follow. And then I wanna to touch on where we are with the, with the vaccination pieces. So, 
the board knows this, that effective October 18th, 2021, staff who work in public schools in our state were required by the state to receive a COVID vaccine vaccination or an approved exemption. We worked really hard as a school district to uh, put all those processes in place and adhere to that requirement and work with our employees. Um, the, you can see by school district on the state website on the right side of the screen is a little screenshot of that. It's our, our district there, one of 295 districts in our state is, is uh, shaded kind of in dark green. There we are. Uh, we have 80% of our employees, so it's not just teachers, it's all, all employees who work in the district. 80% um, are, are vaccinated, 20% received approved exemptions, and we only had two, two employees in the whole district who um, chose not to meet the requirement and, and therefore can't, can't work here. Two, and we have about 3,000 employees. We're, we're the largest employer in, in the city of Kennewick. So um, we were able to, to, to meet that requirement from the state in terms of, of staff vaccines. There is cur currently no COVID vaccine requirement for students. I think everybody knows that, but it's just important to, to be said. However, the State Board of Health right now and the Department of Health have convened a technical advisory group, what they're calling a TAG, to consider a COVID-19 vaccine and they're looking at, I guess the state board has some criteria to make a recommendation about whether to add it to the state's list of required immunizations for school entry. So there are there are requirements like measles, vaccines and things like that for schools. Um, so uh, that's not a decision that's been made yet. It's not a decision that we make locally. It's not a decision that the board makes or the district staff make. It's a decision that's made at the at the Board of Health, and they're in the process right now of seeking input on on that decision. So it's important that people are aware of that. I want to talk a little bit about um, the funding and legal implications for all of these requirements. And here's where um, you know Bronson will be able to help uh, answer questions and so forth too. So the beginning of this school year. Uh, Superintendents across the state received a message from Chris Reichdahl, who is the state superintendent of public instruction. And um, here is a, a clip from that message, and, and I won't read it all to you, but it, it um, speaks to the fact that the mask order continues to apply to public schools. It speaks that under this RCW, which is a law that the government has brought, or excuse me, the governor has brought emergency powers and that those RCWs have the power of law. And um, it speaks to the constitutional authority of the state superintendent to supervise all matters pertaining to the public schools in the state. And so apportionment, that's funding, apportionment amounts and timing are shaped by additional law, but you can see here he says, but let me be clear, I'm quoting uh, Superintendent Reichdahl, boards or districts that intentionally disobey, dismiss, or shun an explicit law, including a governor's executive order, which has the power of law, will see an immediate halt to their basic education apportionment and their federal funds that come through OSPI. And I'm gonna show you some data in a minute that shows you what, what that means in terms of actual dollars to our, our district. Um, any district that does not offer full-time in-person learning also would not receive their apportionment. So then he followed that up with an official letter that was uh, to superintendents and school board directors. And so this is a snip of that letter. It's actually page one and page two of that letter. And I won't read you the whole thing. I know that um, board members who were here in August have seen this and our, our new board members may have as well. But it starts off by him saying, at the end of July, I informed you that OSPI intended to withhold funds from school districts who willfully fail to comply with the health and safety measure required by Governor Inslee. And then the letter concludes by uh, saying that, uh, and it's kind of, I think it's bolded there, that these safety measures that he speaks to are, are not at the direction of local school boards or superintendents. Okay. So I've mentioned RCW and, and WAC a couple of times, and so I just wanted to um, 
clarify for everybody what what those are and there's a, a reference to the legislative page to hear of where this information came from. So in RCW, the RCWs are the revised code of Washington. It's a compilation of all permanent laws that are now in force. It's a collection of session laws enacted by the legislature and signed by the governor or enacted via the initiative process and it's organized and arranged by topic. Then Washington Administrative Code, that's WAC. Um, those are regulations of executive branch agencies and they're issued by authority of statute. Like legislation and the Constitution, regulations are a source of primary law in Washington State. And the WAC codifies the regulations and arranges them by subject or agency. So there's a whole set of RCWs and WACs that apply to public schools as an agency in our state and we're required by law to follow those RCWs and WACs because they're law. So there are um, laws, WACs now in the statute that speak to what will happen if districts don't follow the mandates. So the first set here defines what is a local education agency, an LEA, when they talk about an LEA in the WAC, it's actually a school, a school district um, or an ESD or a charter school. And then um, the next definition they have is willful here. And so they said is used in this chapter, this set of WACs pertaining to public schools, willful means non-accidental action or inaction by a local education agency that the local education agency knew or reasonably should have known would violate Proclamation 2009, which is the, which is the, the mask mandate. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to read all of this to you. It's in your board materials, but um, what it spells out is if there's failure to comply with the health and safety requirements that we've been given as a public school, what will happen first is OSPI, the state superintendent's office, will notify us that we're out of compliance and give us 15 days from the receipt of the notice to verify that we're now back in compliance. Um, verification of compliance means a resolution passed by the LEA, which means the board. Um, rescinding any actions previously taken prohibiting com com compliance. So what this means, and, and Bronson can help me here and make sure I'm interpreting this correctly, is like if the board were to try to pass a resolution saying we're not going to follow these mandates, they we would get a notice from the state and we'd have 15 days to rescind that notice until they withheld our funding. And then there's a second notice that comes into play and um, you've got five days from that time to, to um, have corrective action. And if not, then they're going to withhold apportionment. And then you can only get your apportionment restated um, when the state superintendent determines that the district is back in compliance. And then there's some additional reduction of apportionment after what they're calling persistent willful failure to meet requirements. So just in terms of what this means for us, um, it's important to, to, to highlight. So our district current year has a revenue budget of just over $285 million. We've got 18,500 students that we're responsible for educating in 32 schools. We've got over 3,000 staff members. We're, we're a big operation. 74.3% of our funding comes from state apportionment. That's $212 million out of a $285 million plus revenue budget. 9.2% of our total revenue budget comes from the from federal sources and I didn't I don't know if I highlighted it well in what I just read, but they say if you don't follow the requirements, we're going to withhold your state apportionment, your state revenue and your federal dollars that flow through the state. So that means $212 million plus $26.3 million withheld. The other thing that I want to highlight here on this particular um, graph is down here at the bottom, 
where uh, you see local property tax and levy equalization. So as board knows, um, we've got a, a levies coming up here um, on the ballot in February. So this local property tax, this dark blue piece of the pie represents our current EP&O, Educational Programs and Operations Levy Funding. Based on the property valuation of our district, we receive additional state funding if we can pass our local levies, and that's what this levy equalization funding is. So this, this maroon color piece of the pie comes from the state as well. We only get this levy equalization money from the state if we can pass our local levies. So what the state has done is they recognize that a Kennewick School District, for example, when you look at our whole assessed valuation, including our um, residential property value and our commercial property value, we don't have the same kind of assessed valuation as say a Bellevue School District right on the, on the west side that has a lot more residential property, um, higher property values, more commercial property, more population density. So they recognize at the state level that we can't seek the same sort of funding locally for our programs that a Bellevue School District can and, and keep the tax rate reasonable for our community. So they say to districts like ours, if you can pass your local levy, then we'll give you additional state funding through levy equalization. We only get it if the levy passes. So I do want to just take a minute to highlight a couple of important things because funding was a priority and all of this is really tied together uh, about our ep and levy coming up. So this is the levy that funds health and safety, student learning and staffing, instructional support, operations and maintenance, and athletics and activities. So this is just how funding works in our state. The state doesn't provide us enough funding to actually fund the programs and staffing that we need to have for our students. So um, health and safety is a great example. We, we use levy dollars to fund the great partnership we have with the city of Kennewick and KPD to provide school resource officers at our middle and high schools. We use levy funding for that. We use levy funding, um, it was mentioned earlier, for nurse staffing. We get staffing for four nurses from the state for the whole district and we bridge the gap between what we get from the state and what we actually need with levy funding. Um, programs like AP and IB um, are levy funded. Uh, parts of people and, and um, teachers and paraeducators and uh, maintenance and operations workers um, are all levy funded. And athletics and activities is a, a great example. This is an area that is fully funded through the levy. So we don't, the state doesn't see extracurricular activities and athletics as part of the program of basic education. So um, we just wouldn't be able to have those amazing programs for our kids if it wasn't for the levy. So again, I just want to, if you see the big picture of, of our funding, um, we do rely on, on local community support. And if we can get our local community support, we get additional state funding, pardon me, um, through that level, levy equalization, but we don't get that if we don't have the local support. And then um, the vast majority of our funding comes from state apportionment and 9% uh, of it comes from federal funds that flow through the state. So when we talk about the funding implications of these requirements and what will happen if we don't, Without this revenue, we literally cannot function as, I mean, we can't pay our teachers, our people. Um, it's not about being greedy. It's about getting funding to run. And those of you who have businesses and jobs, you know that organizations can't function and pay their staff and pay their utility bills and, and pay gas for their vehicles without funding. And this is how we get funded. So uh, a little bit about uh, local board authority. Um, the, the local authority of the board comes from the legislature and that's um, spelled out in RCW and which is the law. And um, the, the, it says here that each common school district board shall be vested with the final responsibility for the setting of policies ensuring quality in the content and extent of its educational program and that such program provides students with the opportunity to achieve those skills which are generally recognized as requisite to learning. So, so really what this is highlighting is that the legislature has provided the authority to the board 
to oversee the educational program. And then it goes into what those specifics are. So there's things like um, budget and curriculum and other things um, that the board boundaries that the board ha is the authority on. The board makes the decision. And for the decisions that the board can make and, and, and makes, it is um, absolutely the board should have the rationale for that, um, the, the reasoning behind those decisions that, that they are authorized to make. So um, the other thing we looked at at the um, at the uh, at the board um, retreat a couple of weeks ago was the board policy on the code of ethics, and we spent some time looking at that. And all board members agreed that that this was um, a good a good document. And and so there's a piece up here uh, in here about upholding and enforcing all laws, state board rules and regulations, and court orders pertaining to schools and that desired changes should be brought about only through legal and ethical procedures. So uh, the board is tasked with upholding all of the rules and regulations. And, and I mean, as a staff, we have to for all the reasons that I just shared. And there is an advocacy role of the board to bring about change if the board so desires through legal and ethical procedures. So I. Um, Board members can speak to this much better than I can, so you might want to talk about this during your board discussion, but I just wanted to include some of the information from the board's um, professional association, WASDA, that focuses on advocacy. And, and you heard, I heard some uh, board members talking about legislation. So the legislature has started their session, right? They're in week, uh, we're in week three, they are, of their legislative session. And so um, the board's role is to really be paying attention to what's happening in the legislature and um, keeping an eye on those things and how they pertain to schools. So there's a local advocacy role that the board has outreach to state and fed federal legislative issues. Um, so uh, that there's a piece and there's a, you know, a piece for the board to advocate at the state level with our lawmakers, the people who are making the laws that we're required to follow, um, that the um, you know it's through legislative conferences. Day on the Hill's coming up this next Sunday. It's virtual this year because the legislature's meeting virtually, but uh, the board has the information on on that. Uh, oh, excuse me, the legislative conference is on Sunday. Day on the Hill, the opportunity to meet with legislators and advocate is uh, following legislative conference. So um, there's there's work that the board can do there and of course at the federal level as well. So uh, with that, I have one last piece that I want to share because it's related to the student performance piece that the board said this is a, an area of um, collective focus as well. Priority and it's a priority for us too. So we do have some updated state assessment data on uh, you know how our how our students are doing. So our students took the state assessment data. Excuse me, took the state assessment this fall, and um, the the results have now been released. And there's a a couple sort of things we should be aware of as we're looking at this data. Um, this is a statement from OSPI that um, recognizing that due to the limited in-person learning time last year, we didn't the state didn't have state tests for our kids. And um, now because students were assessed at a different time of year, they were assessed in the fall instead of the spring and in a different school year, um, we should really use caution when looking at these scores and trying to make a, a comparison. However, there's no denying that COVID has not been good for our kids. You heard it tonight, it's not good. It hasn't been good for them academically. It hasn't been good for them socially and emotionally. And you're going to see in this data that it's it's one data point, but we need to keep our kids in person learning and focusing on learning. Uh, you'll see that across the state there was decreases in English language arts scores from 2019 and um, data statewide showed that the um, opportunity gaps for some students, including students and families with lower incomes, um, and students who are multilingual, they were disproportionately impacted. And um, 
so, uh, you know, I, I, it saddens me to show you these scores. Um, but so we've work to do and we want to do that work. We want to keep our kids in school and, and working with them. So what you see here is our uh, three charts that highlights our elementary, this is district wide data. So this shows that the orange line is the state data and the district line is shown in blue. So you can see over the years where we've been in 16, 17, 18, 19, they, I can't get yet the state level grade level grade specific data. So that's why you, you don't see the orange line go all the way out to 2021. But you can see that we, there's learning loss and opportunity for a recovery and, and acceleration. That's our uh, elementary English language arts. Similarly, at the middle school, where students have taken the test, you see the dip in learning. I'll go through this quickly, um, but then there's the, uh, math too, and math, the scores are, you know, worse than they were, um, and you know, uh, even bigger dip in mathematics at all grade levels, both elementary and middle school. So we, we want to roll up our sleeves and continue to focus on our kids and our learning, their learning. So with that, I want to, um, you know, Bronson's here. Uh, the board has questions in terms of legality of uh, of any of this information or wants him to elaborate from a legal perspective. Um, now, this the opportunity to do that in board discussion. So, Mr. Connors, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's a tremendous amount of data, both things all, all very worthwhile. Um, so, again, so there's lots of information. Um, you guys have any questions, concerns, comments? Overall, uh, just the Bronx. Okay. Uh, question. Is it, can we ask questions overall? Or is it? No, I think, I, I think I, right at the minute, I'd like to open it up so we can talk to either, either Bronson or Dr. Pierce. I have some, uh, oh. Data on oh, please. Some, some bills. Please. Bronson, do you want to keep talking a little bit more into the. Or do you want to come here? Yeah. You want you to come here? So there's, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of passion on the, on the mandates, and uh, so I looked into it. There are two bills pending in the legislature right now. Like Tracy said, the session's been in for three weeks now. Two bills, and I find them interesting, and I don't think they're getting enough publicity. One is uh, Senate Bill 5039 uh, that restricts the governor's emergency powers. The interesting thing about this bill is it has bipartisan support, so it's sponsored by um, almost an equal amount or more Democrats than it is Republicans. Then there is a similar bill coming out of the House, which is uh, House Bill 1772, and that also has a lot of bipartisan support. And if the board recalls, um, there were attempts to uh, bring forth these similar bills last legislative session last year, but it didn't get any bipartisan support. They were shot down. So it's interesting this year, they got a lot of bipartisan support. On House Bill 1772, there's actually a public hearing on January 31st uh, to take comment on that bill. Um, Senate uh, House Bill 1772, one of the sponsors is our local uh, legislative rep. Brad Clippert, and I encourage you, if you have any questions about that, to contact his office. Contact his office to see um, what people can do to, to uh, provide comments at the public hearing. What is the now name of that Senate bill? I'm sorry. I'm have to, I'll look it up. Sorry, but, and then just briefly, you search it. You can, you can even search, you can even Google HB 1772, it. comma, yeah. Washington State. And it'll come up. Uh, increasing legislative involvement in gubernatorial proclamations relating to a state of emergency. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, I don't have the title for the the Senate bill, but there. So um, I, w I just want to give that information to the board, and uh, just because you heard a lot of passionate people here tonight. Well, these folks are the ones that are making our laws, and they need to hear from the people, especially on this side of the state. Okay. Yes, Ron, go ahead. 
That is a great point, Bronson. And I just want to elaborate on it just a little bit because I don't know if people know that they can actually petition to speak for and against a bill. You, like, the public has, just like here tonight, there's an avenue that the public can also uh, take advantage of to let people know that they are for or against a bill. Michael. I don't want to be mean, but I think this proves that we are disconnected with the community because this is an issue of mindset. Okay. When I was a young kid, I was, I used to ride a lot of motorcycles. And I remember riding a motorcycle and I went around a corner on an old logging road and I wrecked. I got knocked out and I burned my leg with my muffler. The next couple times I went riding, I was going so slow. And my dad said, why are you going so slow? And I said, dad, all I see is rocks. I go around the corner and I just see big rocks everywhere and I'm going to wreck. And he said, don't look at the rocks look at the path forward. We have a mindset that is so we just shut it down before we even like consider anything. And that's what people are talking about. We know everybody in the world knows that the governor Inslee has a mandate and he's going to pull funding. Everybody knows that. So when we talk about that, that just proves how disconnected we are. What we're asking for is is will is effort is rather than when we bring a point forward you guys just shut it down what we're asking for is that you say you know what let's try to find a way and we've never heard that it's a matter of mindset all you all we do is shut it down shut it down shut it we're just like door stops shut what down Michael? what do we shut down we're asking for when we say something like hey we are we we you're the school boy yeah when we're when when we're asking for something when i i don't want to call people out i'm not trying i'm trying not to do that okay but when when it's brought so let me rephrase it when we bring forward something it, i i feel like or when i bring something forward to discuss or to look at i feel like before i even get my sentence out it's a huge to just no and i'm like can we just look for a way around the rocks can we talk about exemption process you know we mentioned that there's a thing that has you have like a 15 day right you know before they rescind right we, we, if we were to stop the mandates for example there's a 15 day window right well guess what governor Inslee has done for two years he just re 15 14 day window 14 day window 14 day window can we look at can we just like explore that what if we pull it for 15 days Put it back on the 13th day, wait a week, pull it back for 13 days. But I mean, I'm just saying, can we just just think critically? Let's just try. Could it's you just, help me though? It's just Could effort. you help me? You, you've been here. What have you presented that we just shut down? Give I, us some, some facts. Give me a fact of what you presented and we've just shut down. Okay. Uh, without, then yeah. I don't have to call people out. You want That's me to do that? No, do it. Call them out. I want to okay. know. I've asked, can we look into the exemption process? And I say, and I hear, nope, we can't. Exemption for what? I'm sorry. Exemption for masks, exemption for vaccine, any kind of exemption. Like, like it, I just, I just hear no, and I'm like, well, before, can we just look into it? Can we just see if there is a easy, if we, if there's a way we can get. Um, make it easier for the public, for the students to get exemptions. I mean, there are students that are suffering. And we just basically say hard stop too bad keep suffering we don't care i mean but have we actually like really dove into it when we were today we got an email about the quarantine thing and as, and the answer was nope we can't have a, we're, the, it's a, the answer is you got to be quarantined and everything and then but i look at the, i'm looking at the laws right here and it says that they should be quarantined for at least five days with the person and if i see all these should and if statements and then now we have a new law that says that we have been confirmed if somebody has COVID within the, the last, you know, within the last 90 days. I'm just saying like all these things are coming out, right? So like, let's, let's look at that. And when I talk about, hey, we have local restrictions that are above and beyond 
the state and you know what you what Mike tells me? No, we don't. You know what Tracy you tell me? No, we don't. And I'm like, but we do. But we have them because I'm experiencing them, going to schools, I'm seeing them. Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to call you out, you know, but I don't want to call Bronson out. I mean, I you love. Can call me out. Call me out. Yeah, call Tracy, people. please. Please. I, I just want to acknowledge that, um, and I, I think I said this in my presentation, but um, you, you have, I have heard from board members expressing concern about particular schools, and I have followed up on those. We have the emails back and forth. I've got, so I, I just, I, I, I feel the need to say yes. I've, I've heard those when they're surfaced and they come to me as superintendent. I follow up on them and confirm back with you. Um, there's also, you know, on non-COVID things, we've recently had uh, questions come up about PE credit and um, J-1 visas. And when those come up from, the, from individual board members, I look into them, I delve into them, and I come back and when the, those two examples come back with changes and, and good You're news. Right. Thank you. I, and I was the one who did that and I appreciate that. And I, I really, today when I was reading your comments, I was really grateful that you that you followed through with that. I really liked that. I felt like you had an attitude of, yeah, let's try to get something done. And I really appreciated that. I really did. So Bronson, do you, do you want to comment at all or elaborate at all on any more of the you know, what's, what's in the law here? Hey, Bronson, can I, can I ask you one question? Sure. Have you, do you know of any school district, and this, I'm just throwing this out there because I guarantee people want to know, do you know any school district that has gone against the mask mandate, for instance? Have they, have, has anybody legally tried to go against this proclamation that the governor has, has issued? Are you, are you aware of any? There's one. Kittit House uh, School District uh, this the beginning of this year and their school board um, took a position they weren't going to enforce the mandate and and so the state came in gave them the 15 day notice and say and told them you have to show us the steps you're going to take to enforce the mandate otherwise we are going to begin to uh, pull your funding. Kittit House uh, School District then did a 180 and uh, they took steps to enforce the mandate. That is the only district, and I did some research, there's 295 districts in the state of Washington. That is the only district that's done that. I, I guess the reason why, it, it, we went through all these laws. I know everyone is frustrated. I'm frustrated. Um, there's a reason why I went to law school, because I like to see change. Um, the reason why I brought up those two bills and you should read them. Uh, if those, if one of those bills passes, there's one that, that limits the um, governor's emergency powers to 30 days. If the emergency lasts longer than 30 days, they have to go back to the legislature. If that passes, that means his emergency powers immediately cease, which means the mandates that his emergency powers are based on go away. But for the legislature to pass that, they need to hear from the people. And I think that's what happened this last year because there were bills proposed last year that had no bipartisan support. This year, they have a whole bunch. And so that's the way that you make change. You elect your local leaders to make laws. There's a process in place to provide testimony on what's going on. You talk to your leaders, you provide testimony in Olympia, and you get the laws changed. We also have a voice, right, as a school board. Like, we have a voice. Like, we can we can speak up, and we as a, as a team can speak up and say, hey, we want these mandates gone, right? Hey, we can say, like, I would like to look into this 15-day resend, 15-day resend thing and see if we can't recycle this thing over and over and over again, right? I would like to look at that and see, are there, can we, can we find a way where we can at least give a little bit of freedom for 15 days and then resend it and follow their rules and then do it again, just like Inslee's doing to us, right? I mean, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, like, just an idea, a thought process, an effort. So one of the kids today said, you said that we know that you don't, you can't make laws, but you have a voice. 
that uh, like that was awesome like we have a voice let's use our voice let's let the community know yeah we agree with what you're saying and we're going to like we're going to back that up and we're going to try we're going to give effort rather than just stonewall you in the face we're going to give effort I, I take exception to the stonewall in the face i'm sorry i'm trying to be quiet but the allegations that you're putting out there are just they're not true we have taken on you know, the school safety issue, getting money, getting money for networks to go on school buses, uh, making sure that we're the first one to get schools back in place was not done because we stonewalled and we didn't listen. The accusation you're making are absolutely not founded. We have a very strong school board. And when I say we, I'm including you. You cannot exclude us and talk to us as if we are against you. We are not. We are a unit. We are a team. And we do make a difference. We made, we went through teachers' negotiations, listening to what the teachers had to say, getting to a point that we had a contract that we can live by. We did it with, the, with, with so many issues that come before us. That's the purpose of the board. And you can't tear us apart by accusing us of not, the things that you're saying are inflammatory. You know? I agree with you. He has the floor. You got to get to the point where you do not put us down when you've only been here a month. It's a hard working board and it's an insult. I'm taking it as an insult. I'm going to tell you, my God, I sit here and try to be quiet, thinking that that is the way to go. It's not. You need to hear this. We are not against you, but you have to work in unison. I'm not talking about you. you, Ron, cannot, you you're talking about the board, which is me. That's what I'm trying to get in your head. We, when you say you not listen to us, you are talking about, we are us. You are part of us now. Okay. And if you ne you have change, bring it forth. Those ideas you have, bring them forth. And that's how we made the change. You cannot accuse me of stonewall us as stonewalling with so much we've done yep. over over the past decade. I guess, I guess in my mind, I was more speaking to Mike, to be honest with you. And I wasn't speaking to you. Actually, one thing, Ron, I appreciate you and everybody in the public knows that I've said this, is that I really appreciate how well you listen. And when I talk to you, I can feel you listening, and I really admire that, and I appreciate that, and I mean that. So let's let's, for example, can we come to a low or a common denominator about masks outside? It's it's already done, isn't it? No, Mike. Have, Mike, if you go to visit, this is what I'm saying. If you go see that, see right there, it's already done. But what I'm saying is, it's not done. See, right, that's a very good example. I'm bringing something forth, and what do I hear? Oh, it's already done. But it's not, because I'm in schools, and they're telling me to put my mask on outside. He asked the question, I, isn't that already done? No, it's, it's right. not already done. Like of my, Tracy spoke to this earlier in the presentation. Tracy, would you please follow up on that? Yeah, so um, I just want to clarify on that. Uh, Mr. Valentine, you, you raised a concern that you visited a school and you were told by an individual staff member that you had to wear a mask outside. You, when you, when that was brought to my attention, I uh, reached out to the principal and um, clarified, and the principal clarified with the individual staff member. So there's nothing in the requirements that say you have to wear a mask outside. It's only indoors. Um, when there's instances where there's a misunderstanding or communication or an individual staff member has misinformation um, if that's given to me as your, as the superintendent i will work to correct that which i did um, so if there's more instances of that i know um, in some of your school visits and talking with administrators they're choosing to wear a mask they're not required to wear a mask so it's i mean it's totally cold fine. outside for one thing but yeah and and i think of the principal saying i'm choosing to wear this mask mm -hmm. for whatever reason um, that's their their choice. It's not a requirement. It's not a requirement for kids. But if there are issues like that that you're aware of that I haven't resolved yet, please let me know and I will work with with my staff and get those resolved. So how do how do we communicate these expectations and priorities to the schools? Because I know I've spoke with you on many occasions where mm -hmm. We have these things going on in school that are above and beyond what should be happening and we need them corrected but how do we how do we make sure that the schools aren't aren't doing that how do we make sure schools aren't 
forcing parents to stay on sidewalks and send their kids up to the school while they watch them on the street, right? How do we how do we enforce that we don't have you know, how do we make sure teachers aren't telling kids, oh, we're going to remote remote learning and sharing that, which is not accurate information? How do we ensure that we have, you know, these these things communicated so that we can ensure that this is happening across the district and it's just not piecemeal piecemeal across? Because I think we all can agree there's enough restrictions, there's enough mandates, there's enough of that. But, That's but a great, we, we don't want to add more sure. and we don't want that to happen. So how do we communicate that? How do we get that? So the, um, the board hires a superintendent <laughs> to to be the CEO of the organization and to, um, to, to to manage the organization along with a really hardworking, effective team. So uh, we do proactively communicate. In fact, uh, we've got a principal here. You can probably, <laughs> well, push on swap, but you got a message from me. Not you, not just you, but I, I, you know, messages go out regularly from my office and the other um, super, assistant superintendent offices, clarifying expectations, clarifying information. It's done during weekly meetings with administrators. I mean, we, we're a big operation. Um, so it, there are going to be times where somebody gets it wrong or some, you know, an individual staff member has misinformation. And so it's a combination of proactive clarification, working with our highly, highly effective leadership team um, to, to clarify and understand what all these things mean, and then individually um, addressing issues as they come up, either from parents or from board members. So they get directed to me. I know the one that you're talking about was a few months ago, I think, actually before you became a board member. Um, I, I think that you contacted me about that particular issue and uh, working with the assistant superintendent of elementary, we got that resolved. So, so we're gonna we're gonna do those things and make sure those things happen when they come our way, and we're gonna proactively communicate. And we can, you know, we can continue to communicate and communicate um, more broadly um, about what all of these things mean uh, from the district, and I think that can help too. I, I want to give an example. Uh, like you said, like you guys, I've been to every single school in the school district. Did it do it on an annual basis? And one uh, one visit was at Southridge High School. This was before COVID, and I walked through, and people were having lunch on the floor, on on the ground, on the, on the floor in the hallways. I could barely get to the principal's office. I brought it back to your predecessor, the person that was before you. Brought it up before this board, and people said, "Okay, that's not right. We want to uh, allow changes at Southridge High School." that would increase the amount of space that they have for people to sit down and eat at a table. It was done, but it was done through the school board and the school board superintendent. So there's a way to make change. There's nothing wrong with proposing change. That's what we're here for. We want to make the change for good. Always looking at how can we improve the uh, learning environment for our kids. We can make that change, but we won't be effective if we're not doing it together. There's no need for us to clash. There's no need. We can read through. Yeah. And Mr. Harsh, may I just kind of piggyback on, on Mr. Mabry's comment? And, and that is, and, and we talked about this as part of the board retreat too. So there, we have, we have five individual board members who work together as a unit to give direction to the superintendent and uh, to govern the district. So individual board members, uh, have opinions and thoughts, and it's when the board as a collective group agrees on priorities, direction, et cetera, and then gives that to me that I can act. Um, but what I what I what I can't do is figure out what to do when there's five individual board members <laughs> giving different direction. So that direction has to come from the board. That's what the board's authority is acting as a, a unit and as a board. And I'm here ready and willing to work for you, and I do. You do. Can I ask, can I ask the board a yes or no question? Can we put out a, a statement um, reminding all parents and students and staff that it is okay to wear masks outside? Is a yes or no question. No, to not wear masks outside. 
Uh, yeah, masks. Okay, can we put out a statement to all to everybody that says masks that that states that masks are optional outside? Can we do that at the question to the board in, in light of what Ron said? I don't see why not. I mean, it's part of the part of the rules we've discussed that if that's part of the protocol that kids can wear go outside without the mask, and absolutely. So I only have one question. So, sure. Sorry. Are we going outside of a protocol that we should propose that and then vote on it at the next meeting? Can we bring up something tonight? Well, and that's well, I'm sorry, sorry yeah. but that's my question. Because I mean, my understanding, Micah, to your point, is that they, the children, are not mandated to wear masks outside currently. So again, so that's that's the back and forth we have. So that's the case. I mean, we can we can certainly reiterate the fact. I'm just not sure people know that. That's yeah. what I'm saying. And if I may, I, I, um, you know, that's part of what's regular, what is in place. And so there's not even, I don't believe a need to take any board action on that. Um, communicating what the what the rules are is part of what we need to be doing. And if that's, you know, unclear to people, then that communication, I can get, we can get that out tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I was, has there been a consideration and I, I just completely brainstorming here, but we have all this information compiled. Could we send that out to the community or is it already out there for the community? This, Zach, you're talking about this, this whole. This yeah, just the, the, like all of the laws that we're looking at, all of the information. It's, it's, it's a lot of information. Uh, yeah, right? that would be the. the daily downtime. It's, a, it's a pretty big deck. Yeah. I mean, it's. So it's a matter of public record, so it's not an issue. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a matter of whether you know we the people want to have that much information. Yes, Tracy. The, the other the other thing that we do um, now, and we started this a uh, couple months ago, right? Is we're we're recording the board meetings. They're live streamed. Um, they're recording and able to be viewed after the meeting, along with. Um, presentations and so forth and then uh, from the communications department we send out what's called a board brief uh, after board meetings kind of summarizing what happened at the board meeting and it includes now the link so um, which is a great thing being having a lot of transparency about what's happening and what's being discussed and presented is is what what should be happening mm -hmm. and so that is happening thank you yes that's great Dr. Pierce, I have a question related to what Zachary just said. So on on the board brief, are there specific links to these types of things or could there be those things if people were so interested? Yeah, that, that is one of the things. Thank you for, for bringing that up is how do we better sort of make it easier for people to access the presentations? Um, you know, our hope is that they're, you know, sometimes just looking at slides without the presentations hard, but, um, you know, finding a way to prov provide that and then also encouraging people to watch the video so they can hear all of the discussion and explanation and so forth. So yeah, um, these materials are all, we, we want to make them more accessible to pe people. We'll do that. And I know it's very time it's consuming, um, but you know, my thing about always having it come out in Spanish too, Yes. Um, and I appreciate the communications department doing that. Um, and I know this takes time to put these things together with the legalese that then is there. It's not the same as normal communications. But I would just encourage that to please be there for our families. It's it, absolutely. So real quick for Bronson and, and you, uh, Tracy. So Bronson, you mentioned this bill, right? So maybe this bill happens and we're all saved this huge topic and, and the governor's powers are eliminated and, and the mandates go away. So we immediately follow that and we drop masks, right? Because that could potentially well, because the, the happen, law, right? yeah, the laws that are in place with the state right now, that's a frustrating thing. And I've never seen it in my time as an attorney where a state, the, your elected state legislatures are given so much authority to one person in the executive branch. Um, but you're right. So both of these bills, one out of the Senate, one out of the House, it limits the amount of time the governor can have emergency powers without going back to the legislature. He's now had emergency powers for almost two years. Both of these bills, one is, I think, 30 days. The other one is 30 to 60 days. If it passed, that would mean he'd have to go back to the legislature to have uh, exercise his emergency powers immediately. 
Um, and as you know, the, the process works. There can be more bills that are proposed. A lot of times, that's why it's so important to get public testimony because these bills will be going through committees. You take public testimony, the, the um, lawmakers hear the testimony, and then sometimes they'll modify the bills or they'll propose a new bill similar, and then that'll go through. And ultimately you'll have some bill that might be a combination of these two or a new one that they, based on what they heard from the public will end up getting passed. But it seems like it has more promise this year just because it has, it's not just, uh, it's just not Republican. It's, it's bipartisan on both of these bills. Um, they've gone across the aisle and it's, it's both parties that are sponsoring it. And, and the irony in all this is once, once the mask mandate drops and we are looking for everybody to de-mask, then, then the irony is going to be masks are going to be optional. So now we can still continue to have students, staff, everybody in, in masks, right? So it's just kind of ironic that, that that's a potential road bump we're going to run, or a roadblock Whoa. or a hiccup we're going to run into in that regard, right? Because now, now we're saying, you know, you don't have these potential restrictions, but then we have students learning, you know what I mean? Like with math still. So well, certainly the, I, I would anticipate certainly there's still going to be students that will want to wear masks. Sure. You have a lot. Yeah. You have a lot of um, students that might be compromised that will want to wear masks, feel more comfortable masks. The, the biggest change is it's not a requirement, just like a lot sure. of other things we do in life. It's not a requirement. We can we have the freedoms to do a lot of different things. And if these bills pass, then we have the freedom not to have uh, wear a mask in schools. So real quickly, I'm going to jump in here one second and then I'll, I'll get back to you here. So one of the other ones that uh, my wife was kind enough to send to me here is uh, Senate Bill 5909, which uh, basically concerning legislative oversight of gubernatorial, gubernatorial powers concerning emergency proclamations. Now on Friday at 10.30 a.m. they're opening up for public hearing and that's a big, big deal. It's exactly what, what Ron has been pushing here and has been advocating here ever since I've been on the board is, you know, publics jumping in and, and, and participating in their government. Again, this is this this is a huge, huge deal. And interestingly enough, there's there you would think there'd be hundreds of people signed up to speak and there's been like 30 people signed up. Mm -hmm. So if, if this is such a huge issue and people are so aggravated by this, which fully understand they should have 100 people. The same people who are in here tonight should should be absolutely saying, "Hey, I want to make comments to the Senate on, on this bill." And you can. Yeah. Yes, I. And what I want to say exactly piggybacks on that. So many people are afraid to testify or don't have the time or not able to to do the actual testifying. If if you do choose to do the testify, you only get a, a minute to 90 seconds. So that's sure. about 150 words, and they usually don't call on everybody anyway because they don't have that time. But you can go in um, to walledge.gov and you can do just written testimony and, and it's to our own representatives and you just say you know dear senator or rep so and so this is how i feel on this issue this is why or you can just go in and check pro or con yeah. you don't even or oppose i think it's pro or, or oppose you don't even have to say anything those are all you know given their little spaces they're all put in the, our legislators receive them you can send to other legislators at times some some of them won't take from non-constituents but you can write to people who are not our our uh, reps in the aid here and 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 they will do things for you and I've I've done that before so it, it's it's not difficult to just go in and check pro or pose it's not difficult to write a, a three sentence written testimony it is a little nervous as Zachary knows, to um, to be called on and to have to speak in front of people, although you're at home in your jammies on Zoom, but it's still it's still nerve wracking. But there are things, as you said, you can just go in and do it. It takes no time whatsoever. And as a representative government, that's what they're supposed to listen to us. So when we have those those issues that we feel strongly about, I believe it's our right, certainly, but it's our our, our obligation. To, to make those comments to our, our um, people that we elect. Thank you. Thank you for your, all of you guys for that. The wis that's really good information. The wisdom, I appreciate Bronson, you looking for, you, you looking up these bills. Mike, I appreciate that bill you brought up, Ron. I appreciate, and Diane, both of you guys, um, 
and talking about. So my question is, and we kind of like piggybacking off of you guys and trying to in that in that spirit of working together with you, can we push? Can we um, like like put those out to the community? Can we? Can we? You know, because because like th that that helps that helps people, right? There's so many people who are angry, and now we're saying we understand you're frustrated. Here's an avenue, and here's three bills that are coming, and then and then kind of this like give that information to the community to, to allow them to speak up. Can we do that? that that's a question for Bronson. I don't because I don't know the legality of that. I don't I don't know what. what well, we're we're uh, we're hoping people are watching the school <laughs> because we're doing it right now, and right. and because of uh, the efforts of I think mostly a big effort from Mr. Valentine and Mr. Galbraith. The the meetings are online and more people can watch them. More people can see the discussion, what's going on. Um, but definitely all of you as elected officials can talk to your constituents, talk to your supporters and say, hey, there's these bills that are pending. Uh, so can we put it out to the public as well in another form? I know there's this meeting, but can we also maybe email or something or, or put on the website or something? Well, I guess the, he's the, like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can as an individual board member uh, because you have you have certain feelings, you have uh, certain beliefs. You can as an elected official, as a board member, um, you have contacts with those that supported you. Put it out to them. Um, contact uh, Representative Clipper. He's one of the sponsors of the the House bill. Contact. Senator Sharon Brown, she's a sponsor on the Senate bill. So as a district, yeah. we can't do that. Well, we the, those two are the ones that are more appropriate because they're they're the ones that are supposed to advertise the bills that they're sponsoring and get to get those that have elected them to put them in office to help support uh, the cause. Because really, the reason why they support these bills is because that's what they think the people that elected them want to have happen. And so they put these bills forward, but then they need the backing of the people that have elected them to support them. I mean, you, you can see if these bills go to the legislature and there's 10 or 20 people, 30 people that only sign up statewide to provide testimony, I think the, the lawmakers will see that. If you see a bill that has 200, 300, 1,000, 2,000 people that sign up to provide testimony, they're gonna take notice like, yeah, this is an important issue. We got some angry people out there uh, that wanna change. So the answer to my question is no. I'm asking as a board, can we can, as a board, can we be united and say, hey, community, we support these these three bills. Here you go. What do you guys think? We support them as a as a board. We are making a united statement, right? And we're in, we're saying that we support these bills, and then we're pushing it out to the community, saying, hey, we're united. Here's what we think. You know, could we not do that? That's my, it's kind of a yes or no question. Okay, can I continue? Don't go away in case I'm wrong. So um, when the board takes, so how it works uh, is if the board wants to take action on something, right? There's a, um, that's where the Roberts rules come into order and potentially, uh, you know, a, a resolution, a statement or whatever that the board has to take action on. And then as a staff, we could communicate out, here's what the board is has done. Right. So here's, can I make here's, a motion? Is that what I would do? Well, so I'm going to well, defer because Mr. Okay. Connors is the board president who's running the meeting. I'm no, the no, staff no. side. Um, so I just want to, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to step on no, any toes. I'm just saying process wise, that's how it would work. If the board wants to do something collectively together, there's, that's where something gets developed and voted on and um, agreed on through the board channels. And then we could communicate, you know, through board weekly update and those kind of things. Here's here's action that the board took. If that action is, you know, voted on by the board. So Mike, so here's, do you here's, want to add something? There's a suggestion. So sure. a lot what a lot of uh, public agencies do um, is they will uh, have staff based on 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 what they want to have happen, what action draft a formal resolution and you as a board collectively can pass a resolution and in there say we we support these proposed bills and you can briefly describe what they are um, and as a board we feel that they're important and whatever other purpose you want to put in there then you have a written resolution 
it's a lot easier to send it out to the public than just having a, a, a verbal motion that's passed by the board. And that generally is what happens. Um, you as a board um, passed an action to support the levy and encourage the community to support the levy as a board collectively. You also have the authority to do something like that. So it's basically basically putting out a statement of support for a, a, a given or and encourage or or if or if what the board's intent is to to encourage the uh, the public to uh, look at these bills and, and support them and you as a board support the purposes of these bills you can have that as a resolution if it's passed then the resolution can be sent out to the community how do we get to that step make huh? a, how do we get to that step so make a you make, you make a motion. A motion? Mm -hmm. I'd like to. You, you'd like to make a resolution. I would like so, to. So, so what? You, you make a motion. Okay. This is what you make a motion to authorize district staff to bring back a proposed resolution in support um, of in support of Senate Bill 5039, House Bill 1772, and then the other bill that Mr. Connor. Okay. Can I do that now? Can I make a motion? You I may. move that we that we um, put together a resolution to support Bill 50, 5039, 1772, and 5909, and, and vote on it and present it to the community. I'll second it. The motion has been presented and seconded. Is there any further discussion? It is. Yes, sir. Uh, do we know enough about this? I know, Bronson, you did a good job of bringing it to our, you did a good job of bringing it to our attention, mm -hmm. but like, most things there's more to the story and i would like to hear the pros and cons micah I, I totally respect what you just did that is the way that we do things thank you and the way that we come to a decision and we hear the pros and cons i don't know enough of pros and cons so i'm not i'm not saying no i'm not quite sure how to vote on this but i would like for it reworded some way so that we can uh, study it. Yeah, that's fine. Get the facts and then make that motion. Because there are proposed, the, the bills are proposed that it's really easy to get uh, a draft of the current uh, state of the bill, where it's at, the language of it. Um, so we, we make a uh, amendment to the to your to your. Ron, could you do it? Since you're well, you're, you're uh, obviously know this, can you do it? Let's see. I, I'll give it a shot. And, and, and please let me know if I take away from what you want done. No. See, this is what I like about you, Ron. This is what I love about you. That's what I like about you, man. Because you keep telling me what you like about me. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's, here's what I propose then. And, and help me with it, because I'm going to stutter through this. So, what if we make a motion that we study Bill's the, the two proposals? And may and the board come up with a decision on whether to support or, or, or whether to support those two bills. Okay, I second that. So, well, they're just they're hearing it. So Is that's it a friendly thing? amendment, then. So, does he have to make a completely different amendment? Well, that's a, a good question. Came out of the air because we don't supposed to hear the audience. But a, a good most. How much time do we have on to to make such a well, the, the bills are pending. So the Senate bill right now, they don't have a uh, 5039 doesn't have a hearing schedule, at least when I checked it today. Yeah, okay. the, the bill, I don't know about the status of the bill that Mr. Connors brought forward. It sounds yeah. like there's a hearing. 5909 yeah. is stated is slated for uh, uh, public hearing on Friday. And, okay. and it is Correct. it is um, it is it happens uh, frequently where these bills as they're working their way through there will be uh several hearings okay. um and then house bill 1772 the public the public hearing the next one is scheduled for january 31st okay. so that's next. we gotta hurry up <sighs> mr connors the, yes, the the bill that you brought forward is oh, that a senate bill 5909 Senate Bill 5909? Uh, Senate, Senate Bill, I'm sorry. Yeah, Senate Bill SB 5909. So, and again, I, I would, so our next meeting is in two two weeks. Yeah, so in two weeks. They're still going to be in session. I know this, we're pushing it out, and I'm, I'm certainly not trying to push this down the road. I'm just trying to figure out how we can kind of serve all parties here because we want to make sure that we're informing the public, as we are tonight, having good discussion, 
making sure that we're encouraging them to to participate in their state legislator to, to make the changes they want to see happen. Um, and also to your point, Mike, coming out and, and having a united front saying, hey, look, we're we make a resolution supporting these, you know, these bills because these will hopefully they get passed. They will cure a lot of these ills we're all concerned about. Yes, Diane. So I'd like to make a suggestion that and, and Bronson talked about this as our own people within our own circles. We can very quickly make those comments to people that we know and share information with. Sure. Yeah. That could be done when you leave tonight. Yeah. And it's then already happening. and then According if we um, go forward with the methodical process of making sure that it comes out accurately because there's always things that happen when you don't think they're going to happen those unintended consequences of what you write and so i feel more comfortable letting staff go through things parsing out what words because words make a difference and then coming back with to us and then we can go back and say this 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 so that you have a, a well thought out and planned resolution and if and we can get people to do it immediately okay. now so that might be a, a middle ground so that it gets out there quickly but from the board it gets out there very accurately that's a very good point and the other thing too is remember that all of these board or these bills will be as they go into committee and on the floor okay. they will be chopped up sliced i mean it comes out it's like a sausage mill in there when it comes in one and you know you don't want to know it comes out the other so having time again to have these things work their way through a little farther again in two weeks these things will will have made it to the floor or will will be dead on arrival. A lot of things will be happening. And so I uh, given it some time to let this thing play out a little further. We can use it, you know, again, if we, if we only knew someone who had a social media company that could, you know, put this out there somewhere. So the whole point is getting that out and getting out in front of people in order to encourage them to do this. Then we have it gives us a couple weeks to come out and make that proclamation. Say, hey, look, we are supporting these in their current form. Okay. Because again, I think they will change. In fact, I guarantee they'll change between now and, and you know two weeks from now. Okay. Very good. And so, yes, sir. I guess just want to clarify uh, about the motion that's on the floor. I think Mr. Valentine made a motion. Mr. Mabry amended the motion. So and then, then and that was all that. Happened. And that's where we are. So do we want to do we want to rescind the motion or do we want to direct? We want to direct staff to research these bills pertaining to. Um, I I personally do. I don't know what the board feels, but I do. Yeah. Well, we can yeah. we can. Then so, you can make that motion. So, Better yeah. did. Well, the motion made. Yeah. Yeah. The motion's made, so we want to have we have a motion to requesting the staff to research yeah. these the stated bills. Yes. And come back to us in two weeks with. Uh, Center, and, yeah. and I assume that that motion includes any other bills that may be uh, developed between now and then that are similar to these. Right. That'd be great. The same topic. Yeah. We need to work on our Robert's rules. We got to do we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> All right. OK, so we have a motion first and seconded. Uh, Patty, I, I don't know if there's a second. There was just I, I oh, second. no. I I seconded seconded it. It. Oh, you said yeah, yeah, sorry. So uh, Thank you. no further discussion. I will call for a roll call vote. Okay, so I'm showing Ron made a motion that we study the three bills. I've got them listed and the board come up with a decision on whether to support those bills and any other bills similar to these. Is that correct? Seconded by Gabe. Okay, roll call. Um, Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. There you go. Look at that solidarity. Perfect. All right. We good to move on? Yeah, real quick. We're just going to recommunicate the outside thing, right? That's OK. Perfect. <laughs> I, just, I just didn't know if we got to that point yet. We thank got you. that point. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Bronson Tracy, thank you very much. Yeah, thank thank you. you. OK, we're moving on. Get to know public, get to know Kennewick schools. Robin Chastain is going to make the presentation. Thank you, Robin, for being so patient. Good evening. I'll 
scoot up out here a little bit so you oh, can hear me. She works. She lives here. All the time. She's always here. She's a she's a good one. Okay, I'm here tonight to present information about our Get to Know Kennewick Schools. Um, for those of you that have been involved in the school district for quite a while, you'll know that Get to Know Kennewick Schools was a day-long event that we held here at the Administration Center, actually about a half a day event. Um, it ran usually to from about uh, 8 in the morning till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And we used to hold in-person workshops um, that our community could attend. And we fluctuated between around 100 and 125 people. Um, so when um, COVID happened, we couldn't hold this large scale event anymore. So we transitioned to a webinar series last year. Um, and um, we got to kind of dip our toe in the pool of offering um, online topics. So a lot of the topics came from our traditional um, workshops that we used to have. And so we held a series of those and we averaged about one a month last, um, this last year. And so then this year we decided to um, do a little tweak on that same formula and it was pretty successful the first year, but we definitely um, had some lessons learned along the way. And we decided to um, use some feedback from our parents survey that about commonly asked questions and, and things that parents want to know more about. And that's how we um, decided on the topics for this year. And these are all pre-recorded now and they're a little bit more scripted and they touch on a lot of the FAQs that we received from our community throughout the year. So, um, let's see. This just goes through about a little bit about what I said. Um, the first one that we kicked off in January um, for Get to Know Kennewick Schools was working for Kennewick Schools. That is definitely the number one question we get is how do I get my foot in the door at Kennewick Schools? And people want to know about our hiring process. It's not always intuitive to get onto our hiring website and apply for a position. And also people um, that have never worked in school districts might want to know what the difference is between a classified worker and a certificated worker. It's um, a whole new language that we speak here in, in education. And so um, Dr. Christensen gave a great um, presentation, very informative um, about how to get a job in, in Kennewick schools when we hire and all the information somebody would need to know to apply for a job. Um, also, we've already recorded, and this will be the next in the series released, is a presentation um, from Dr. Pierce regarding school levies and bond and why bonds and why they are important to our school district. A lot of the information for this presentation has been um, um, comes from one of the she's probably made 40 levy and levy presentations so far to our community, and a lot of the information is some of that same information we're just repackaging and getting it out in a different way. Also coming up in February is um, how our district curriculum is selected and adopted. And this might be a question that you get being on the school board. Coming up after that is earning high school credits. Um, so Mr. Anderson's going to present information about how students can start earning credits as early as middle school and get a jump start on that 24 credit requirement. And then he'll also include some credit retrieval information and in zero period classes and other ways to get credit. Um, Mr. Anderson will give a presentation in April about earning college credit in high school. This is a traditional one of the information workshop that we used to have and it was always really well attended. So we wanted to make sure that we included that again this year. And then future um, videos that we have in our series are dual language opportunities in our district and how those opportunities are expanding, re-engaging students for graduation, 
and the role of the school board, which um, Mr. Connors will be involved in. I don't know if he knows that yet, <laughs> but um, he'll be involved in that with Dr. Pierce. <laughs> I meant to ask you that um, because that's definitely, that's kind of a new question that's come up is what is the role of our school board? And so hopefully we'll have um, a resource through a video um, that explains that. So the great thing about doing these video series is that they're there um, for a longer life than mm -hmm. our one day workshop would have been. And so when we do get these commonly asked questions, we have a video to refer them to for more information. Um, and that I think has been really, really helpful, especially for the people that work here in administration. Does anybody have any questions or comments? And what's the dates on that, did you say? Um, they're, they're almost bi-monthly okay. from now until the end of the year. Sweet. So, I was just going to say I listened to a few while they were in Zoom and I really liked having them. So I appreciate that, that we provide that to the community. So thank you. Oh, no problem. And also I attended the in-person ones a couple of times and, and they were fabulous. I loved them, but it was a hard time for people to come in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so you got a lot of young people or mothers who were staying home and all bringing their babies. So it was very hard for them. I carried a bunch of babies around a few times so they could listen or people who are retired. So mostly parents of kids in our school district, it was very difficult for them to come. So all of this that we put out there, it's available 24 hours a day. You can watch it whenever you know it's comfortable for you. And, and I love that part of that. And you can watch it over and over because like I watched Dr. Christensen's one and I worked in the district for a long time, but there were things that I learned by watching it over and over that I didn't know before. And so I, I have a person who wanted to know about jobs, so I sent it to her and she wrote like pages and pages of things. But she said she had to watch it over and over between feeding kids and putting kids to bed and bath and all that. But she was able to 10, 15 minutes at a time she could watch it. So I, I, I really appreciate that and that's really reaching out to our community. And as to the one about the school board, that's one of WASDA's big pushes is to um, to have Actually, you know, most people don't even know what a school board is or how, how school boards get here or what they do or why they do it and who the heck are those people. They don't even know. So, you know, this is a big thing because we want to get more people involved. We want people to run for school board. We want them to be involved with schools. So um, I I know Mr. Connors maybe didn't know he was going to do that, but I, I really appreciate the fact that our board gets to do that. So thank you also for doing that. Yeah, and no problem. And I also wanted to add that um, because we put these videos on YouTube, there is an auto translate feature yes. that we use in Spanish and Arabic um, to reach more families than we used to, even though we had live translation here in the building when we had it in person. Um, now it's available to a wider audience. Awesome. Can, have we thought, are you, I'm assuming we've maybe thought of this, but we can't get to know the Kennel School District without the students. So are we, do we have one where it involves students or maybe or is that not anywhere am I way off base here or do we have we thought about having one with the students sharing the things that they love about the Kennewick schools and anything like that rather rather than yeah it just hasn't the that's a really great suggestion and we haven't done that through this video series but we've definitely done it in other ways through our communication department and highlighting student achievement and highlighting our students and the staff in other ways um, could we always do more of that? Yes. Okay, that's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Any other more questions for Robin? Wonderful, Robin. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I don't think there's a problem. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> we clap. <laughs> okay. Next up is the KSD Learner Profile. Mr. Scott will be presenting. Okay, good evening. Um, so, uh, 
originally we were going to go cover this information at the at the board retreat and that ran a little bit long and tonight's meeting is certainly running a little bit long as well. So I'm going to do my best to kind of work through the presentation part because the most crucial aspect of what we want to do tonight is get your feedback and discussion around the draft of the learner profile. So I'll kind of go quickly um, through the slides. Some of it is review, um, but I but if you have questions at all, just feel free to stop me as I go um, because we want to make sure that you get the information that you need. Um, so again, the, 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 the basis for really working on a learner profile is found in our strategic goals. Having all students ready for, for, for their future um, entails helping students learn some crucial skills around digital citizenship, social life, and employment skills. We also have this in our annual objectives for this year that we are going to um, be completing the development of the KSD Learner Profile, um, further defining those, those key skills as, as well. So this is really um, your first opportunity to take a look at what is really our second draft um, because we've been working on this for a little while. So tonight I wanted to quickly go through the vision and the purpose of the learner profile so you kind of understand exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Share a little bit with you the draft or the presentations that we've done and the feedback we collected. Um, Zach was part of that as the, one of our student groups. Just kind of get you an idea of some of the themes and some of the revisions that were made. But the most important part is to have you put eyes on it and to do a little bit of an activity with us so that we can get some information that I can take back to our design team. As I mentioned to you in uh, December, uh, we have a, we had a fairly large group of, of a work group put together um, covering a lot of different uh, voices within our, our school community um, to help us to develop, go through a process of developing the learner profile. Um, the main thing is that we know that when students leave our system, they, they have to meet three requirements. They've got to get a, do a high school and beyond plan. They've got to get their credits and their subject area path, pathway requirements, their graduation pathway options in. But all of those really don't mean a whole lot unless um, students are gaining the skills that they need for post-secondary education and employment and, and life. Um, and so if the purpose is really to declare that a student's ready for that, we need to make sure that we are paying attention to those skills and attributes that are really going to be beneficial to our students. And so here's a couple of quotes that really kind of en encapsulated the vision of the, of the group that was working on this. Primarily that we need to really develop within our students the ability to persevere and problem solve and deal with hard topics, much as we've been dealing with tonight. We also want them to be prepared um, for a future that none of us can really envision. And, and we want to be preparing them not for the future, that, or not for, not for the present, but for that future. So really, the, the, we don't want with the learner profile to put together a bunch of nice words and put them on a pretty page and put them up as posters in the school. We want it to really be a purpose behind it. And so these bullet points really kind of def define what we view the, the, the purpose is. One is to kind of help us as we develop strategies to achieve the district strategic plan, particularly with goals for students. Another one is really to think about those skills and, and, the, and, the, and the attributes and the dispositions of learners that we're trying to get. It's one thing to teach them curriculum. It's another thing to teach them those skills and to really just decide as a community um, what is important there. We also wanted to be able to focus our, our community, our parents and, and community members, so that they understand what it is that we are preparing our students for and that they have some feedback because they're the ones who are employing our students or, or hoping that their children become employed and get college educated. Um, and it also, we know, will help us as we create kind of the impetus to, to implement those strategies and to help us kind of move forward. Um, so, Again, we want to look at things such as what kind of experiences are we providing students? What is, how can we use a learner profile and those skills to further develop our curriculum? How can we engage students in their own self-reflection around those skills at various points throughout their education, particularly when we start with um, doing high school and beyond planning? What proficiencies are we looking for in the adults we're hiring into the system? Our teachers, our principals, do, are they coming with the skills to help, to help students develop those attributes as well? and then really just having a common vision. As we looked, and I described in December, um, all the different profiles we looked at, here are some examples of common, common skills and attributes that are found in learner profiles, and you'll see that um, in ours as well. Um, we did go out and we did a, completed a draft around the end of September, and then we spent a couple of months going out to community groups, student groups, parent groups, our, our teachers, um, administrators um, just to get feedback. And so this is a list of the different groups. We uh, presented to about 150 or so stakeholders in all those groups. And of those, um, 
you know, about half of them provided us feedback in some written form that we could kind of go through and take a look. Um, the overall themes that we got from that first draft were that the overall, the feedback was very positive. They felt like the skills, there was a high level agreement that the skills that we were outlining were those that were really important. Um, we had a lot of feedback though, just in Brown, the clarity and clarifying and better defining what those attributes and our I can statements are. And I'll show you the, the examples in draft two here in just a second. We had um, two of our attributes. One was critical thinker and one was creative thinker. Um, and it was really hard for the folks who were seeing seeing it to see a difference between the two. Like what's what does it mean to be a creative thinker and what does it mean to be a critical? And there was a lot of overlap. So we took that into account when we went back and did our draft and we kind of combined the two. Um, there were a number of comments regarding students' abilities to process differing viewpoints and perspectives, how they can do that so that they're not just buying into one perspective, but that they're also able to, with tact and with grace and with and, and with really handle other viewpoints and they thought that was really strong. All of our groups really came through saying that they wanted that to be strengthened. And then generally there was feedback in regards to some of our, what we kind of consider maybe soft skills or other things around financial literacy, life skills and student self-determination that they thought should come out in a greater degree in our learner profile and then a focus on social emotional skills. So we took all that feedback and we um, went back as a group and revised and we, and so what you're gonna see is our second draft and um, we would like to get some feedback on that so that you can you have a hard copy in front of you um, but there are five attributes um, that are identified that we we felt would help demonstrate those four skills that are called out within our strategic plan goals critical thinker and problem solver collaborator communicator community contributor and cultivator um, we wanted we liked that they all started with c that was a good organizational feature for us each of the the attributes has a short description, but then they're followed by a set of I statements. And the I statements are really designed to help guide students and families and teachers as they kind of help identify um, kind of those student skills as they go. So I'm, I'm not going to read through them um, word for word, but I will just kind of highlight a couple of the things in regards to critical thinker. We really wanted to make sure that we were focusing on the fact that we want students who can create new ideas and build on old ones. Um, we want them to be able to be resilient and persevere because problem solving is hard. Meeting challenges is, challenge, is, is something that requires that and that they see more than one way to solve a problem. And so then there's I statements that kind of correspond with that. The collaborator, um, again, we wanted to make sure that we were having our students um, engaging in the, the art of collaboration, not just working together on a project, but really getting in depth in what it means to effectively collaborate. And so the I statements go with that. Communicator, we felt that it was really important to encourage throughout a student's educational career the ability to actively listen and share ideas in a variety of different ways. Um, and so the I statements go to that. And the community contributor, we wanted them to recognize that, that we live in a community and that you're a citizen of a community, both you're a citizen of our country and our local community and that there are responsibilities and opportunities that come with that. And so we felt that was really outlined within those I statements. And then the last one was really cultivator and, and cultivator was one we, we really worked around a lot but really the last sentence is really why it's included it's really one who promotes and improves their own self and so we really know that we, what we want to do is develop with our students a growth mindset and the ability to grow beyond just the the 13 years they spend with us so um oh, I went too far um so what you have in front of you is you have the hard copy that has the attributes with the I statements in it. You have a couple of highlighters. You have a pink highlighter and a yellow highlighter. What we'd like for you to do is to do a couple things, I guess, first. If you have any questions, certainly ask them and as I can clarify. But then we also wanted to have the opportunity to take a few minutes to kind of look through, marking with the yellow, the things that maybe resonate with you that you think are strong or that you agree with or you think are important as part of a learner profile as we're developing it. The, the, the pink highlighter can be used to, to maybe highlight things you question or highlight things that you think maybe are clear or maybe need rewording. And then you have an opportunity to take some notes on there too. And we also want to encourage you to have some discussion around it, but I know that the, the, night, is, the night is moving moving on. So those were kind of the, uh, the protocol that we wanted to just go through so we could collect it and then take that feedback back to our group and come up with our final so are you asking us to make comments on the I statements or the description or? Any part of it. We, we, we think that the description of the attributes is really helpful for defining what we mean by 
cultivator, for example. So if it's clear and you like that, then that's great. If you think that we could do something different, or if there's a part you really don't understand, go ahead and highlight it with the, the nice statements. And so with the when we we sought out community feedback, um, are the trades look are, are the trades involved in that at all? Like the the building trades and those things, are they part of that group that we sought feedback from? So what we did is we took it to our CT advisory group okay. that does that does have a mixture of that. Um, and then when we do our um, our final implementation plan, there'll be a wider communication plan. But okay. yes, there were, okay. um, yeah, we, we attempted to get feedback on that. And the student superintendent advisory council has some students involved in, in that stuff that they, they would have been able to provide feedback okay. as well. Great. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. sure. I don't know if it fits in here, but uh, communicator. There's a skill in communicating where you don't, uh, you get your point across, and but you still socially acceptable. It's uh, so many young people that came up tonight. I was very impressed with their skills and their the nerve to come up. Mm -hmm. But being a human being, hearing some of the things I said put me on the defensive right away. And there's a way that you can present your thoughts. Mm -hmm but also avoid putting your audience on the defensive side. Mm -hmm. It's an art of communication. Can that be captured in here? Or is that captured in here under the communicator side? I, I would certainly suggest that if you can see places where it is or, or something you might want to circle or where it could be strengthened, if you don't okay. see it at all, just make note of it okay. And, okay. and then we'll take that feedback okay. Um, okay. And, sure. and see if we can you know, kind of flesh out another Sorry. statement or something along those lines. Okay. So not our, do, we, do we get time to do our homework or are you expecting this this evening? Well, gonna I'm going to defer to Dr. <laughs> <laughs> we were well, what, what I might suggest is what I you could take it with you yeah. and uh, and have some time to pour over it and then bring it back to the next board meeting. Okay. Would okay. that mean a good time? Does that give you enough time or do you, or do you, you need prefer? it sooner? Yeah. Well, actually, so so what we're what we're hoping to do is be able to to implement this plan, begin the implementation process in the next school year. So beginning in August. Um, so what we really need to do is just have time to develop that implementation plan. Um, I think we were originally hoping to get a final approval on it tonight, but then it got bumped. Um, we can we can make whatever work as long as I think if we get it approved. Um, get some action on it by the end of February. I think we can probably easily get that implementation plan together. I, I think we can safely say we can we can certainly handle this at the next board meeting. I just I would like to go and give this some yeah, some, no, some thoughts absolutely. Some time to tell us this just to make sure we're doing this with the, you know consciously. Yeah. Yeah. And if we have questions, we can email you. You certainly. Yes. Wonderful. Any other questions for Matt? Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. OK, find my agenda. Uh, so we are on to new business. The annual board member compensation policy. Dr. Pierce will present. OK, so this is uh, the annual board discussion about board member compensation. So policy board policy 1532 speaks to board member compensation and the fact that board members are eligible to receive compensation at the rate of $50 per day for or for a portion of a day for the following activities, um, including attending board meetings or special board meetings, uh, as well as a number of other things. I won't read all of these things to you, but approved training and development activities, attending special board related activities, et cetera. And total compensation for a calendar year uh, shall not exceed $4,800 plus reasonable expenses incurred for travel meals and lodging. Annually at the first board business meeting in January, which is tonight, the board votes uh, whether to accept compensation or to waive compensation allowed under state law for attending to official board meetings and business. So um, should the uh, should the board vote to receive compensation, there's a monthly claim, um, et cetera, thing that needs to happen that's spelled out in policy. Should the board choose to waive the compensation, there's a form uh, that is the regulation 
connected to this policy that the form, uh, excuse me, that the board uh, signs to waive compensation. So uh, that's the information about the topic and I'll turn it back over to you, President Connors. Thank you so much. Um, in the past, at least in the two years I've been doing this, we have waived compensation. That's that was the decision of the previous board. We can certainly have the conversation again. Um, my question is what, when I first came on the board, we talked about doing something with that money, whether it was going to do a, a scholarship or do something like that. And that was kind of battered around, but I don't think we ever, we ever made a decision on what to do with that. Yes, Diane. So there were legal issues to that. Was there? Okay. And somebody can remind me what it was. If you know, if you, if you accept it and then gift it, then you're, it's taxable income. And then there was some question about not being able to carve that out because I went back to look about why we made that decision. Gotcha. Okay. Tracy, do you, you know that? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, Ms. Senfix, remembering that correctly, uh, in order to, to accept the compensation, the board has to take it as compensation and it's reportable to the IRS and all of those kind of things. And then you'd need to donate the money back to, to the district to be able to put forward to something. We couldn't just take the money and put it in there. Does sure. that make sense? Where, do, where does the money go? Like if, if compensation is waived, does it just go like back into the general fund or so is there a way that using this similar amount per year that this we could create some sort of scholarship out of the general fund? There's Kinda. some gift of public funds. Um, restrictions okay. about what we can do with our funds because we have taxpayer funds. Um, I know I'm looking at Vic across the room here <laughs> who might uh, be able to elaborate on all the fiscal rules. Um, Vic, if, if there's anything you think that would be helpful to add to, to this, you can come on over. If you think I've got it covered, that's fine. But if you have anything to say, if you could come to the microphone so we could pick it up, that would be helpful. That's as he's coming up, I thought it was two avenues. One was ASB, oh, and the other one was uh, I thought we could uh, leave it on the table for the, the lunch, the the kids that couldn't pay for the lunch. And I don't know if that applies now, but, uh, but I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, probably the. the if you if you wanted to take the money and do some with it and earmark it, you could uh, you could earmark it for something, but not as a gift. You right. know, you could say, well, this is worth five thousand dollars, and we want it to go towards buying books, or you know, as an example. So that's probably you know the cleanest way if you're really trying to target that money for something, but you really can't do a scholarship or a, even donating it outside the district would not work. So it has to be for something a, a specific. Uh, that would be best. Yeah. Yes, so to Ron's question. You can't donate it, but can it be to pay off unpaid? That meals? one I'd have to research. Okay. I think we talked about that before. I, we did, I remember. Um, yeah, that's. So you're saying it could be to buy, buy or pay for specific items. Is that what you're Yeah, if it was a, I don't know what the amount is. 4800 $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, per time. Yeah, so you know, $2400. If you wanted to say we want to use that to I don't know if I can move it to ASB. Uh, you know, but like I said the example is we wanted to to buy books or we wanted to buy 500 lunches. Yeah. Well, I can I don't think that'll work. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> Just it out. But can you can you check because I mean I understand that one is a mm -hmm. consumable and one is not but yeah, I'll check it out. Can we check that yeah, out? Yeah I'll talk to Sam and we can he knows more of the rules about yeah. lunches and stuff and uh, if that doesn't work then we can look at something else. Yeah that, that's what I was, I was going to follow up on that so yeah if we choose to vote to waive compensation is there a way can you provide us with some oh, avenues of where we can maybe you know lunches ASB like there provide us yeah. something with, like that so we can maybe yeah. talk as a board if you and determine. wanted to go to asb i can look into that and see if if we can make that those are two different funds so i just need to do a little research on that too so, so no, there's there's options go ahead. yeah no I, I have one more comment so um so for many of us this amount of money is it does not appear
appear to be a very large amount for many of us. Um, and we can go without this compensation. When I think about people um, who, who may want to be on the board, there are some financial issues that may prevent them. And so if I'm a young parent and I have kids at home, I may need daycare. Um, I may need upgraded, um, which I can tell you I had to upgrade because of Zoom, um, what I had for my internet service mm -hmm. at home, which, which was a little scarily not cheap. And so there are some things that, when I talked to some people quite a few years ago, like eight, 10 years ago about running for the board, it was, there's some financial things for some people that keep them from being able to, to do it. And so if we want to diversify our board and be more equitable, I, I don't have a problem finding this for me personally, but um, I, I want to be, what's the word? I want to be cognizant of the fact that there are people that this makes a difference for. And we have set this precedence for, I don't know, forever. I don't know if any board has ever accepted compensation. Um, not since I've been in the district for 30 years. Um, and so I, I want us to speak to that because the very first time that you and I came, this was the very first thing that they did. And they basically said, sign it. And it was like, okay, fine, whatever, I'll vote yes. So I really want to have a, a good discussion and, and be thoughtful about people who come in the future and that this not that people not be embarrassed. I think there would be people who would be embarrassed to say, yeah. I really want this money. I really need this money. I actually That's really important. agree with you, Diane. That was the very first thought that I have is 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 if there's a mom or somebody that that we could that would normally that want would like to run but isn't able to. And um so and my question was even could you know, I mean, could we donate it to someone? I don't know, you but can't do you that. can't do that. And you can't, you can't do it individually. Like, I would say yes, and you would say no. It's got to be oh, the, a okay. board yeah. all in. Yeah, so so I guess maybe just with the idea of, of a kind of a no pressure and, and, and maybe a kind of a constant no pressure thing. But I, I think it would be, I would love it if, if somebody from the community came and, and took the money and used it and it was beneficial for their family. That would be fantastic. So just a quick question. So we can't we can't update the policy with individual like individuals on the board collecting compensation rather than it be an all or nothing. Well, or is that something we can maybe discuss at a well, potential? I don't I don't know if there's rules yeah, that I mean, it's all could, or nothing. That could but, be kind of awkward also uh, as you think about. This. Mike, can yes. you can you check and see? I, to my knowledge, there are no districts that split it like that. Yeah, yeah. But I, it, yeah. it, oh, Dr. Pierce is going to check that. Okay, yeah. um, because there may be some district that does that, and I tried to find that out last year, and I couldn't get any information on any districts that did split that. Uh, but there, this year now may be, and there may be some. I mean, there's there's a bill right now. I don't have the HB number, but it's to increase that compensation a little bit. Yeah. Um, and How much? Um, it's what are we talking about here? <laughs> More insurance. Well, well, it's, it's 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 a big jump. Twelve thousand something. something. Yeah. Like what, a, what if it was like you 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 could look at insurance or something like pay for insurance for a family? That would be. The, that's a gift of public funds, yeah. and so you can't uh -huh. do that. Okay. Remember, you, we vote on it every year. It's mandatory yeah. that we right. vote on it. Mm -hmm. So if we get enough energy on it next year and get enough. We can vote yes, and then you can do whatever you want to with it. You can turn around and donate it back. Right? Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to pay taxes yeah. on it. Back. I like that better, yeah. that you can do something with it. Yeah. So as a board, we can talk like we're doing now, agree to get the compensation, then it's a done deal. And do something with it. You can do and whatever you want. And then it's your taxable income to yeah. I like contribute that. wherever you wish. Yeah. So I think that also sets a good precedent for that. You know, like you say, that mom who needs daycare, and then now there's a precedent where, where you accept it and donate it or whatever, but then now she doesn't feel bad about accepting it or something. You know what I mean? Okay. So you. Yeah, the flip side can, of that, I'll always have to say the flip side. Sorry, guys. If, and this is a minor flip, is that. Now you're attracting people that wants to be on a school board because they get paid. And it, it just worries me that the passion for the kids go away. I yeah. just don't want the passion for the kids to go away. I know I sound pretty sappy saying that, but I sincerely mean it. Yeah. And especially with uh, the pay increasing, it's going to be very attractive for someone to say, 
Hey, I'll sit here eight hours and listen to people. You can pay. <laughs> sure. And I just I want to disencourage that. No, so, I, yeah. I, did, I did say wrong. That's Although good. I think that that get you know the school board will maybe tell them that we don't just sit here for eight hours. You know, <laughs> there, there are other jobs to be done. And so that's helpful too. And uh, um, somebody might do that once, but I don't think they do it more than once. So, you know. I don't know. $90. So do we, do we need to make a motion to waive. So, so, where, so, so where are we here? So I would move that um, for the current year we would waive compensation for the board. I'd second that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Yeah, there's a dollar amount that we need to put on the yeah, phone. What's the total dollar amount? 40? 48? 4,800. Yeah. 4, what's that? Oh, it's 50. Oh, that's 50. Well, this is maybe, maybe all or part of what's it's what's it's different amount. What was it? Maybe all or part of $50 for a chance of $50. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The compensation. Yep. Well, it's so you don't put anything in the blank? 50. Would it be a hassle, Vic, if we did 49? Would that <laughs> make it? Well, <laughs> 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 Okay, we have a motion All first and a second. Patty, I will call for the roll call vote. Okay. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that is the end of new business. Uh, oh, I have a quick question. So it says on here for the period of, for the following period. 12 months. That's good. This is a period of months. So. Okay, so uh, with no more business in front of the board, we are going to adjourn into executive session uh, for approximately 30 minutes. Uh, at that time, I will come back and uh, recess the meeting. Um, that I think that's it. So we'll be I'll be back in about thirty minutes to close the meeting out. Mike, do you want to talk about it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
with no other business before the board, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you.